one thing that um, I did want to get to that we sort of started talking about uh, previously was writing failure. And um, it's funny, I was just listening to the first episode. And one thing that uh, came up there was how at Clarion, my um, first attempt at a fantasy novel absolutely bombed and went around the room. And uh, essentially, as a direct result, I changed genres, I dropped out of science fiction, except as a publisher editor, but I dropped out as a writer. Um, and it took me many years. Uh, Clarion was 1997. And uh, I want to say 2006 was around 2007. I would say 10 years before I tried to write a fantasy novel again. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's a huge part of a writer's life. So I thought we could talk a little bit about sort of some of our big failures and how they knocked us off course. And some of this we've covered before, because you, you've talked about like what led you away from. Yeah. My 10 year uh, break. 10 year break as well. Right. Um, but also maybe how we found our way back. Yeah. I don't know. So, mm -hmm. um, do you want to, do you want to, I can talk about what happened with Harper Collins and the novel, um, now. Yeah. Unless... Why don't you go first? I mean, I think we've, I think I've, I think I should probably think of some other failures. There's certainly, okay. you know, uh, be, I mean, maybe, maybe briefly revisit that, but it's right. yours first. So what happened with my novel? So, you know, when I, I did my PhD in creative writing and wrote Bodies in Motion, which was um, link stories. So it's not really, it's not a novel, although some people call it a novel in stories, but they're link stories. Um, many of them work as standalones. And in science fiction, I think there, it was interesting. Like I, I bristled a little because someone referred to it or a reviewer referred to it as a fix up which uh -huh. is um which i don't i don't <laughs> think of it as a fix up right a fix up is when you publish a bunch of stories separately and eventually you're like maybe i can kludge them together into a into a novel and the readers won't notice or something i don't know that's i that's mean how I, I mean that's a very pejorative take on it i think there's a noble pedigree of the fix up but anyway i guess so, it but comes I feel from like... a time i think of it as having coming from a time where the real money was in short stories yeah right? where it was sort of like you know the Three cents a word was a lot in the 30s, and people published cycles of stories, and then they, you know, they they then bound them together with some kind of frame tale, like like iRobot, right? iRobot's a fix up yeah. where it's like we have Susan Calvin talking to a reporter, and that introduces each story. I think it's just another form. You know what I mean? I don't think it's uh... sure, but it's. I guess it's not. It it doesn't feel right for Bodies in Motion because, no. you know, like, like the book has a coherence that is more primary than the stories like the book comes in in my mind it comes before the stories anyway so it's a story cycle it's a story cycle i don't know anyway that's what it's Le Guin a thing. calls it that's what Le Guin, you know yeah, like zero yeah yeah so what happened is that i tried to sell it right and i had an agent who was interested in my work he was someone who i had met editing he had been my editor on um on one of the erotica anthologies I did for Random House for uh, Aqua Erotica and Wet, and he liked a story I'd written for that and told me to get in touch uh, when I needed an agent. So I finished this book, got in touch, he read Bodies in Motion, he loved it, he tried to sell it, and that was in itself a really interesting process because um, I didn't I didn't really understand, I think, as a newbie writer, like what a, a good agent could do. He reached out to someone who had been, um, who he had known when he was an editor and said, hey, I've got this book, super excited about it. Um, I want to show it to you. I'll need a response in a week and a half. And mm -hmm. um, like, I didn't know that was possible, like to be yeah. able to be like, you have to read this in 10 days. This is a, yeah. a hot property. So uh -huh. she read it. This was someone at Penguin and uh, she read it and said, and got back to him and said, you know, I really like the writing, but short stories are a hard sell. Tell her to get in touch when she has a novel. He then went to another editor at HarperCollins and said, same thing. I need a response in 10 days. She came back and said, really like the writing. Short stories are a hard sell. Does she have a novel? And mm -hmm. um, 
so he, he came, <laughs> so he came back to me and he's like, so do you have a novel? And I was like, I have the idea for a novel. Um, and he's mm-hmm. like, uh, okay, well, get, get me a synopsis and some chapters by Monday. And I was like, I'll see what I can do. And so, yeah. uh, so over the weekend I went and this is, um, here's where I put in my little, um, lesson to all writers back up your work because I had, I had not been Control doing regular S, backups. People. I had not, well, <laughs> no, but I, I had yeah, had a hard, beyond, I'd, that. Yeah. beyond that. Cause I'd had a hard drive crash a few years previously. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'd lost a ton of stuff um, among them, all of the bits and pieces that I'd, you know, sort of been working on for this novel. So I ended up, luckily I emailed people in my writing groups and mm-hmm. I had said, do ah, any of you happen to have me. this stuff? <laughs> and they did because some wow. of them are, are pack rats. And so they sent yeah. it all back to me. So then I had, I don't know, like 40 pages. That's a, that's a lovely parable somewhere. There, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. It's good that uh, some people are more pack ratty than I am, clearly. So And something uh, about social memory and like we yeah. exist as uh, epiphenomena of our communities. I know. It's nice. It is very nice. <laughs> so so uh, our individual failures will be mitigated by by the community. So mm-hmm. um but I do back up my stuff obsessively now. So yeah. uh so the um I put it all together. I drafted a synopsis and uh sent it in and that was on I think Monday and on Thursday I was I don't know if you remember this because you were in the car with me. Um, I think when I got the phone call from Bob, wow. we, were dr- yeah. we were driving up to Clarion in uh-huh. 2000- 2005. Were you in the car Clarion? with me? Clarion, you mean to... To, to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. We were driving up yeah, to yeah. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Sorry. Yeah, it sounds and, familiar. Uh, yeah, and I got the call and he... Well, no, 2005? I don't know if I was there yet, but anyway. Maybe you weren't there yet. Maybe not. So I was driving up to Clare- to Wisconsin and... If not, uh, it's nice that you've edited me into your memory of this moment. <laughs> that's right. And Bob and... My agent Bob said, um, uh, so we have an offer. It's a two book deal. Uh, they would be paying you $25,000 for the short story collection and 60000 for the novel that you have not yet written. Wow. Um, I think it's pretty good and we should take it. And what mm. do you think? And I like, you mm-hmm. know, was having a heart attack on the side of the road. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I said, yes, yes, please. Yeah. Let's take it. Let's run with this before they change their mind. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and then it turned out that I had a year to write the novel, which seemed, you know, which I how did kind that of, happen? How did it happen that you had a year? It, it turned out that you had a year. <laughs> well, they, they, I mean, he told me that would be the deal, right? And yeah. and I, I kind of, um, I was not surprised because I knew that you know I'd I'd been in the field and I knew that a book a year was what publishers liked, and so. But I do think that's where I went kind of really badly astray because, you know, Bodies in Motion took me four years to write, right? Um, and I was in grad school. I wasn't really doing much else. I mean, classes for the first couple of years and then just writing after that. I had a stipend that was supporting me and then my boyfriend was supporting me the following year. So I was just writing and it still took me a year or it took me four years. And mm-hmm. then the novel I tried to write when I was starting my first academic job. So I was learning how to be a professor. Um, I was in fact working two academic jobs because I didn't know how to say no to things at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been offered a gig. (laughs) As this story illustrates. (laughs) I'd been offered a gig teaching remotely at Vermont College in their low residency program. And I had also gotten a visiting position at Roosevelt University. So I was teaching two professor gigs at the same time and trying yeah. to write this novel. And I drafted it that fall. I mean, I did actually like draft a novel in six months. Mm-hmm. I gave it to, <laughs> um, I gave it to my editor at HarperCollins and then there was a nightmare. Then things went really badly at that point mm. because she read it. It took her four months, I want to say to get back to me, mm-hmm. um, which I was just holding my breath the whole time. Right. right? Like, right. Why is this taking so long? Is Particularly this normal? compared to the original 10 days. Right. Right. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and then when she came back to me, and I probably have this somewhere, although maybe I burned it, but the, you know, <laughs> she, she sent me, you know, a three or four page letter telling me all the things she hated about my book, basically. I mean, it was, mm. it was phrased more nicely, but, um, and, 
I just lost it. I cried. I was super sad. It was, it was, it was bad. And, you know, my first novel. Yeah. Um, and okay. And I'm trying to figure out how to shortcut this story and get to the recovery part, but, but uh, well, the, no, sh- need, the sh- no need to shortcut it actually. I think that's okay. part's important too. So I, well, I tried to revise it. Right. So I, you know, like I, I, I kind of went to Kevin, my boyfriend, and I was like, what do you, I showed it to him and I was like, what do you think? You know, and he was like, well, she doesn't think one, one thing Marjorie said was that um, she didn't think that there would be much audience for the book I had written. Mm-hmm. And I, and it was going to turn off a lot of people. And the reasons for why she thought it would turn off people were that um, essentially that my main character was a woman who had sex with some guys early on who she wasn't in love with. And my, <laughs> I know you're laughing, but this was like, she was dead serious. Sure, sure. And she was like, you know, I know the audience and they are going to put the book down and they're not going to keep reading. Um, so you have to change that. And <laughs> I was really frustrated and then the the other aspect that she had trouble with was another like kind of like morality related thing the book was i pitched it as a book about a threesome and Mm -hmm. um i'm polly i've been in threesomes for years at a time but um she i think she was she thought she was getting i think a romance with cheating um Mm -hmm. because she she was sort of pushing for that. She yeah. wanted me to write <laughs> write scenes with the characters cheating, and a, a then monogamous romance with cheating, which yeah, is and then literally like, the opposite. <laughs> and then you know, and then like she wanted the scenes of recriminations and people getting caught, and you literally know, like, what what you're you know what what the poly is meant to avoid. <laughs> right, right. So. So, I mean, so I, I mean, I did push back some, we talked about it and I was like, this is, I, I really do want to write something Polly. And, um, and there were, there were some other elements where, you know, she, there was a bit where my character referenced having uh, been assaulted earlier in her life. And my, the editor thought that that was like too big a thing early in the book. Mm-hmm. And it would, it would pull so much attention that, um that it would overwhelm other things and i was like well it's not that important to the story i can i'm okay with taking that out so anyway i tried to do a revised draft I feel like that's the first of her criticisms that i'm somewhat sympathetic to just from the point of view of yeah I I, you know, but anyway it, it can ha- you know it's interesting though i mean i feel like i i understand why someone would say that i also think i disagree for the kind of book I was writing, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, but, but that, and that kind of comes down to genre, right? Because mm-hmm. what I didn't learn until much later was that she had been a romance editor before mm-hmm. she moved to literary fiction. Yeah. And so she, I think was coming with a whole set of genre preconceptions that mm-hmm. I was not familiar with mm-hmm. and a sense of yeah. an audience that was, that was really different than the yeah. audience I thought I was writing for. And the book right. I, the book I wrote, and you know, Neil Gaiman talks about this. Um, at one point he said that the, the hardest things he's had in publishing were when were moments when the author and the, the, the editor thought he had bought a different book than the one the author thought they were writing. And I think right, that's what right. happened here. Right. Yeah. She, yeah, she thought she was like getting that. like ethnic chick lit with cheating yeah. Right? right, which was going to be like fun and frothy, and yeah, you yeah. know, um, yeah, an easy sell. And I huh. thought I was writing in the vein of Bodies in Motion. Yeah, I was going to say, how did you read Bodies in Motion and not? <laughs> well, I still don't really understand that. But you know, keep in mind, she didn't actually edit Bodies in Motion. The book was in such good shape when I gave mm-hmm. it to her because it had been through yeah. my advisor and workshops and all of yeah. this yeah. that she mostly like. She asked me to change some of the names because they were too similar, and that was it. She didn't. And possibly she, also, you know, from her perspective, I can imagine from a publishing perspective, she might have been coming to it like, well, short stories are sort of for prestige and fun, and of mm-hmm. course, you're doing sort of more edgy things here. But your your novel will be more commercial, like just by maybe, like, yeah. If, if, if the assumption is your your short stories are for playful experimentation and your novel is a commercial work, I can see taking bodies in motion and going, okay, well, we're going to tone the we're going to we're going to dial the commercial up and 
dial the you know literary down uh, when we transition you know by a, by a certain coefficient and then you end up with frothy ethnic chiclet you know maybe yeah no i think that might be what happened it's uh, that makes that makes total sense although i also feel like i think that word commercial mm. is is fascinating right because like pop because literary fiction can do very well right sure. like it oh, can sure. yeah no i don't mean know, commercial like, like um it will make money <laughs> right right so that's, that, well so like that's the thing like there's a way in which we talk about commercial fiction as like formulistic uh, formulaic following a formula and mm -hmm. um and like that it's somewhat predictable that if you write things in a certain way and they're easy reads and accessible mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can you'll have a certain large audience but i think when you're writing lit fiction you know i don't think people are thinking you know well i you know very few people are thinking i'm perfectly happy if only 25 people like read and like this yeah, book, right? right you know like you're still hoping yeah. for a large audience and you know and right i don't think it's i don't think i i think it, i think it would be naive to think that playing it safe in the manner that like when people talk about commercial when i said commercial what i mean mm -hmm. is that um if if all readers want some balance between novelty and like familiarity Mm -hmm. And so there's some bar and there's and there's multiple axes in which you could sort of turn up the dial on how much novelty and how much familiarity this is offering in different ways. And I'm a little allergic to formulaic because I don't think I mean, yeah, sure, there's formula in the sense that like there's save the cat kind of on page 10 of the screenplay that right. reveal the secret thing that the person and then the B plot begins here. Sure. In that sense, there's structural patterns that are formula. But mm -hmm. I don't think anybody I mean, I, I think most people are not most people who successfully write very sort of commercial mainstream fiction are not like phoning it in painted by the numbers they're really writing what they believe in they're writing from their heart but i'm not I mean, sure that's a i mean so i you know like i read barbara cartland when i was mm -hmm. 10 years old or so i don't know if you've ever seen a barbara no, cartland no. novel but you know there are these hundred page romances and i uh -huh. went on a jag of them mm -hmm. uh, when i was i don't know 12 maybe 12 years old and i sat in the library and read I don't know, 50 in a row, right? Sure. And they're the same. They are like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. a Harlequin romance. They were the same. And um, and nonetheless, I got a lot of pleasure out of it. And I, I'm assuming she got pleasure writing them, but they were, it was essentially like file the serial numbers off and write the same book again. Well, right? I, I, I read an interview. I heard an interview, I think is even more dramatic with maybe, I don't know, Barbara Cartland, but I, I read an interview with the woman who does the Sweet Valley High books and she's written mm -hmm. like 200 books and they were talking through like, well, there's been 15 prom nights where the guy, I mean, you know, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. you get the sense talking to her, she's very enthusiastic and you got the sense that it's not, it's like, it, that doesn't mean she's, when I say they're not phoning it in, there was nothing cynical about no, her no, I, about I her she just really liked these stories and she you know yeah. in a way that in a way that somebody who you know i mean it's like when you uh, you know there are restaurants you there's great pizzerias where they just make pizza and it's like always the tomato sauce that grandma made and the mozzarella mm -hmm. and you know they're selling familiarity there can be this enormous degree of integrity so, you go to some fancy yeah. foofy restaurant where they're putting shaved you know yeah. Uh, there's an entirely new squash that they just, got, you know, that then little shaved ringlets of it on top of a gel base of, you know, I mean, I've eaten in restaurants like that too, where they're really pushing the envelope and those are different tastes. So when I say, I think that the thing about commercial, commercial quote unquote is yes, there's a certain, there's a known product. There's a well understood product that they think they're selling that has this familiarity with their, where they're offering familiarity. And that, I would not expect that to make a lot of money. I would expect that to make a to be a conservative play. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like in fact what's going to make what's going to make massive amounts of money is something radically new in many ways or that's a variation on a that breaks some if something breaks out and is big yeah. it's going to somehow maybe it's maybe it's not the first thing that did that but it's the first thing to have popularly carried that over. It's often going to be innovative in some way, you know. Harry Potter is innovative. Yeah. The Hunger Games no. is innovative. Fifty Shades of Grey is innovative. Like these are, I mean, not necessarily all in the same way, not necessarily in literary wear, but they did mm. something. They brought something to the to the broad public that had previously been a niche. Wizard school stories, S and M romance, like that, right? Mm -hmm. That's not. I mean, those are commercial after the fact by dint of being really popular. But I think when when I said, you know, she thought it was commercial, I just think she means 
like that it was something that would be easy to push into the channel because booksellers would know what they were getting. Right. And I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any of that. And I didn't, when I say formulaic, I don't actually mean that to be a criticism, right? Mm-hmm. So I think you took it as more of a criticism no, than okay. I intended. But, um, but regardless, that was the kind of thing she thought she was going to get from me. And I thought I was writing something that was going to um, probably push people a little bit and be edgy and uncomfortable and right, right. Talk, talk about relationships in a way that they were not used to seeing. And I mean, so I still it, want you to write that book. I know. I got to, <laughs> I, I wonder, well, I, you know, I actually think it's not bad as it stands. So I rewrote it four times for her. Yeah. We went back and forth. Over and over, because I had sort of said, like, okay, if I want this story to get out there, I was trying to min-max it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to reach, if I cannot compromise what I'm trying to do too much, and by doing so, reach 10 times as many people, That's that has a value, right? And so so I kind of kept going in, trying to do that. In retrospect, and th- this actually kind of connects a little to um, this interview I did with Paolo Bacigalupi for the SLF's Portland project, where he talks about, you know, he has this message that he wants to get out there about environmental issues, but he also wants to, well, A, support his family and make a decent income, but also reach as many people as possible. And so when he set out to write the wind up girl or shipbreaker or you know his other books he's he is thinking about making them commercial making mm-hmm. them like sure. really broadly accessible so so i was kind of trying to do that i had very little skill at novel writing at that point right so i think in retrospect i didn't know what i was doing and i did a bad job of it and um the book kind of like kept getting worse, honestly. Yeah, like that in is those, not surprising. In those, in those given revisions. the mismatch between, I mean, just based yeah. on what you said so far, given the mismatch because what she thought she was buying, what you thought you were writing, it does yeah. not, I, I would I would like to see the first revision, not the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I, I want to go back and like, now, like bring all the skills that I have now yeah. and just write the book again from the beginning. I think it would look very different, but I actually like, I still love those characters. I love the yeah. plot. I think the, 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 like the, the bones are right. And I just, I wrote it in a rush and then I mm-hmm. revised it to death in the wrong direction. In the right. Wrong direction, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, you know, and I think going at it now, I would probably rather than toning down the things that were upsetting her, I would mm-hmm. be amping them up, right? I would be trying to, to give people even right. more of the uncomfortable experience and, and to that, sense, is that might have them. fixed that might actually be she might yeah. have point i mean you know my i have a maxim that i will repeat many yeah. times in this podcast the opposite of good critiquing advice is usually also good critiquing advice and yeah. in fact like like a lot of things when you're challenging or there's discomfort it's like it's actually it's actually it might have even been better for her if you'd been like mm. not, I mean, maybe not for her because of what she thought she was buying but like for her as a reader to be like, no, 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 I'm signaling from the beginning that this is going to be uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Like, don't relax into this being frothy chick lit from page one. You know what I mean? Yeah. That might have been just as good a fix as trying to, right. much better for you, of try, as trying to trying to file off the edges. Yeah. I. It's interesting. I think it's possible, but I think the other thing that I was running into was sexism, right? Yeah. Because I, I don't think a guy writing the same story about... Um, here's a guy who picks up some random people oh, and sleeps totally with not. them early on. Like no one, nobody would have had an issue with that, right? Of course. Oh, and 100%. so, and so, I'm not sure I could have gotten her past that, right? Yeah. Um, she was a generation older than me, and um, she's she's since passed away, and I, I don't want to. Um, you know, I just started. She, she tried to do her best for me. Like yeah. I want to, I want to make that yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah. No, like I, you know, I, even sure. even even though it was a horrible, miserable experience, and she, I think she was really wrong. She was she was trying to help me, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I just read the beginning. I have never read that much Ian M. Banks, which is a who is a writer that I am often compared to. Like people keep telling you know, like the, the unraveling is very is stylistic, or in terms of the the way that the world is sort of uh, wa- madcap far future explanation but also sort of earnest and like it just it's a it's a people keep going like this is very similar so i should read it i love the wasp factory 
Ian, Ian Banks without the M, which I read right. years ago. But I hadn't read that much. I think I'd read one other one. And I, 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 I just read the first couple I consider Phlebas. And then I, is that what I said? And then I started the second of the um, okay. Use of Weapons. And the beginning of that, to your point about the sexism, and I'm not, from the first one, I was like, I, I don't know. How, I mean, I, I have... I, I trust him a lot about some things. Like I really like the world building and everything. And mm-hmm. then I found the gender stuff in the first one to be like, there were occasionally winsworthy moments where I'm like, why far in the future, when we live on vast orbitals, do you have to have, you know, you know what I mean? Why do mm-hmm. you like, well, she came across as more of a man. I'm like, really? What year is this? But anyway, there were some, but, but a lot of it was okay. And then in the beginning, there's this, there's this, um, we begin with this uh, character, Dizietsma, who is like sort of in this role as sort of the bell of the ball. And she has like mm-hmm. a, like a, a you know, a, a drone that's telling her that she's got to get out of there and go do some espionage mission. And, but she's like setting up this one night, or she's setting up what she's hoping to be this one, this, this dalliance, this romance where she's going to lure this young composer and kind of have this sort of um, like, like all these feels slow burn before she seduces mm-hmm. him. And then because of the espionage thing, she's like, crap, I guess I have to make this a one night stand. And then thoroughly joys this one night stand. And the way that it's written with her sort of unabashed, just like, this is completely for her. She's not doing mm-hmm. this for anything else except like her kicks. And I was just, and the way it's written had this sort of certain convention of her also being sort of like scheming about it and planning. I was like, Oh, don't make her the villain. Like, oh God, yeah. I hope she's not. The, hope she, this is such a such a classically like, um, you know, like like the way you would depict the sort of uh, woman at the center of the web, seductress, yeah. the villain. And then she tried, and like, I, I don't know, I don't spoil her. I, I'm like, I'm like, at the be- yeah, I, I'm only on like the fourth chapter or something, but. But I'm like, oh no, she's the hero. Like that's great. <laughs> it's just, yeah. this is just like this is just like in a way a point he's making about the culture that it's like yeah. she can be completely like she just you know like her having sex is just like completely a win, not mm-hmm. in order to get anything. And I was like, oh oh good, you've just like I, I feel like you've dodged that bullet. Um yeah, but that's but but the fact that I had like the fact that that your editor yeah. was like, oh, she has sex for fun. That's, she's the villain. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The fact that I was like, don't do this thing that I fully expect you to do. Like yeah, that's it was the, just, it was, it, it wasn't, qu- she didn't quite say she's a villain, but she said, yeah, re- but- readers will, the phrase she used was readers will lose sympathy, which yeah. I thought was fascinating because it really does like, yeah, it, ow. It, it points so much to, you know, the kind of, culture of sexuality in america today the kind of puritanical Mm -hmm. like women are not allowed to enjoy sex for sex's sake and this i mean this again this is all back in 2006 2005 2006 so you know if you're reading this now if you're listening to this podcast and you're you grew up on 50 shades of gray like you know where people are reading that on the subway i think it's it's hard to it's hard to understand how how much she was accurate mm. in mm-hmm. in sort of reflecting the assumptions of the time. No, right? I wonder. Like I want. I mean, we're saying that, and then I wonder if people are going to be listening in thirty years, going because you, I I could easily see us recording this podcast in nineteen seventy eight and saying, well, this is before Erica Jong and Fear of Flying, and you may be listening right. to today thinking now women are liberated. Like I don't know. Like That's we'll true. see how well, that goes. Yeah. Like. But I remember, don't you remember, like, Sex in the City was a little shocking mm-hmm. when it came out, right? Like, it was shocking and scandalous and kind of fabulous. And and uh, and today it's very tame. So I, I do think some things have changed in kind of, and maybe there is less, I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of pressure on mm-hmm. girls, um, say, in college, going off and having sex to, you know, cover it with alcohol right uh-huh. and be like oh i was so drunk yeah you know yeah because it's it's there's no way there was no way to be a good girl and also like casual sex mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and i think that is somewhat improved now um over 30 years 20 years ago maybe not but um and yeah and probably- i don't know i it's a good question i mean i think that i think i things change you know it's not yeah. that things don't change and i think that there is a and i love the rise of a certain kind of i mean it's certainly not universal and there's also a backlash but i love a certain kind of like explicit consent culture that sure. that, that that the kids today i mean i you know i mm-hmm. i i love the kind of high bar of expectations of like you know that i think was very much at the crux of that, like, oh, I was drunk. You know yeah. what I mean? There's a certain, um, but 
you know, oppression is also like a dynamic thing that like re-strategizes. And so it's not that we don't make any progress, but it's that like the, you know, there's there's a way in which the oppression goes and goes, okay, I lost that battle. We're going to reconfigure. You know what I mean? And so, you know, so like, like, which is sort of the, the new Jim Crow, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, we can mm -hmm. literally have them slaves, but we're going to sleep this loot hole in, yeah. the, in the 13th Amendment as long as we imprison you. And, you know, similarly, right? right? I mean, and and so I feel like there's a way in which, I don't know, like, I just wonder, like, the pressures, I, I mean, there was a huge difference between the 1950s and my childhood and between my yeah. childhood and, you know, but, but, um, well, and it's, it's often, it comes from different two, angles. And often it's two steps forward, one step back, right? Like yeah. Ever, ever, there's a backlash, right? To, um, who's that? Susan Faludi, right? Uh, mm. <laughs> talks about backlash, mm -hmm. right? The to every every bit of progress in that regard. And I think you know, in the science fiction realm, I think Joanna Russ would have many things to say about this. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I I realize when you're talking, I kind of want to pick apart a little bit that. When I say there was that sexism was sort of at the root of the problems I was having, it was coming, it was inflected in two different ways because part of her problem was what my character was doing. So if I'd been a guy writing that same character, she would have, I think, probably had a, the, some of those same problems, right? Um, and she would have asked, you, if it had been you, she would have asked, she would have said to you the same thing. Like, I lose sympathy for your female character. You don't understand how women are. She might yeah, have said. yeah, yeah. She would have right? been more, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Have women, more leverage women, with me, yeah. Yeah, she might have said, like, women just don't go around and have casual sex right, unless they're right, in love right. or something like that. But um, <laughs> so, but the but the other problem I think is is uh, that kind of no matter what I wrote, uh, it she was bringing to it, I suspect her mm -hmm. assumptions about um, women's literature, what women mm -hmm. are supposed to write, what kinds of topics we should take on, uh, what arena we work in, romance, yeah. etc. And you know, it it reminds me. I did this thing um, that I called the Red Sari Project, which I never really finished, but I have some stuff on it somewhere. Where I was so frustrated with my cover for Bodies in Motion. Do you remember this? Yeah. Oh know, yeah, it was, you know, it like, was a woman with her head cut off cover. Right. So like it was she. It was a woman in a sari, just a torso, a still figure. Um, and it's a very striking cover. It is, mm -hmm. you know, sort yeah. of objectively, it's beautiful. It's on a black background, red and gold, lovely, her brown skin, but she has no face. And um, so it's shown from the neck down, basically. And she's also like, um, she's not even wearing a sari properly. She is oh. not wearing, <laughs> she doesn't have a blouse, right? Uh -huh. So it's just her naked body wrapped in a piece of sari fabric, mm, right? right? right, right. Um, and her skin is wet. Um, and on the first version that they showed me, you could see nipples through the fabric, right? Uh -huh. So it was a very right. sexualized image, which yeah. is fine. But as I said to them, this is misleading because, mm -hmm. yes, there's out of the 20 stories, two of them are somewhat sexy. Mm -hmm. 18 are not at all, right? The book overall is not an erotica book. If it were, I'd be like, we could have a different conversation, right? Right. But I said, this is going to give readers the wrong impression about the book mm -hmm. and you know people listening may not know that authors for the most part get no say in their covers um publishers think perhaps rightly that authors don't know anything about marketing um and what covers sell and so although i will say that that also varies a lot because in small play i mean it's one of the advantages yeah. of small presses small is obviously presses. more say than you know anyway so depends on yeah. how how yeah, institutionalized yeah, yeah. and industrialized a process you're stuck in. Yeah. So the big presses, right? Unless you're a major author, you probably don't get any say. Um, they will often extend to you the courtesy of letting you have input, though, which is what happened with me. I had no rights to the cover. There's in my contract, nothing. But um, but they showed it to me and I brought up these objections and they they actually and I I said also in the Sri Lankan community this is going to be off-putting to people. My dad is not going to want to pick up this book. Mm -hmm. It's going to mm -hmm. cut into sales, etc. And they they said a couple interesting things was one was like, well, we we showed it around all the 
the women at her office mm-hmm. who were all white women or mm-hmm. Jewish women, white mm-hmm. and Jewish women, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. and said, and they don't they don't see any problems with it. And mm-hmm. uh, also, who work in publishing and have absorbed all these conventions or whatever, right? And then they also said, and besides, your audience is not. Sri Lankans or huh. South Asians, your audience is white women age 45 to 65. Wow. Um, which is the, you know, I, I don't know if this is still true. Again, this is 15 years ago, but that was like the target demographic. Those are yeah. the women. That's like the bulk of fiction mm-hmm. in America is sold to that group. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of publishers are going to aim as many books as possible towards that group. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was fascinating. And it, it, Anyway, we went back and forth. We ended up, I got them to like Photoshop the <laughs> cover a little bit to like take down the lens flare on the nipples and yeah, yeah. You know, um, mitigate the wet look and so on. And they showed, they tried a couple other covers that just didn't work for any of us really. And so then we went with it, but I was not thrilled. And so after the book came out, I I ended up looking into south asian um covers in america and because i was curious they were like this is just the way it is right and covers in general like we always cut off the heads because Mm -hmm. um that makes it easier for the reader to identify with the character is what i was told right yeah and that's that's certainly is a thing that happens a lot although i think the trend has moved away from that Mm -hmm. um but at the time i feel like that was a classic example of like if there was one book Mm -hmm. where they had a young woman with, and the head's not shown, and it was like, oh, the reader can identify. They can put themselves in it. Oh, that'd be interesting. That's like an interesting, innovative take for a cover. But then when it becomes like literally every book for young women has no head, it's like, now something is wrong. (laughs) Right. It's like in the aggregate, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, this is your individual, this is your creative choice, but like, now it's become a standard anyway. Yeah. No, it's a, and then it's a, a standard that reinscribes terrible things, right? And so anyway, I did a survey that the short version of the survey is I looked at a lot of covers and I found like Chitra Divakarani, Bharati Mukherjee, you know, all these big South Asian American authors, also male covers, Amitav Ghosh, Vikram Seth, etc. And I found that there were huge differences by gender. The women's covers mm. were predominantly red. The men's covers ah. were predominantly blue. I mean, it was wow. that like basic, right? Wow. And then the women's covers often had women, still figures with heads cut off, like here is an object for you to look at, right? Like mm-hmm. a Grecian statue sure. with, you know, here are the limbs cut off and the head because they have fallen off over the years and this is what you um, can, consume. can consume. The men's covers often had people, usually it wasn't just one person and the people were in motion. It was like yeah. men walking, bicycling, like I'm doing <laughs> something, Engaged right? In, yeah. yeah. And you, and you wow. see their, and you see their heads. And then the women's covers also generally, if they had a, an image in addition or instead of, it would be a single flower or piece of food. So here is a hibiscus, huh. here is right. a butterfly, here's a samosa, right? Yeah. And the men's covers had- Also lands- with mango. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the, the men's covers had landscapes. There would be, yeah. here is a, a man bicycling across a bridge with mountains in the background, mm. or here's a cityscape and the, they just, they signaled really different things. I would say that the men's covers signaled, this is a serious literary work about big issues, wars and nations and so on. People engaged in society. And the women's covers were like, here's something, here's a woman to consume, basically. Right, um, right. And, and, you know, or a piece of food to consume, yeah. right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the most or to interesting... Be con- or to inhabit, maybe. Like, at, at yeah. best, at most generous reading, yeah. like an interior, a, a very small-scale domestic interiority to inhabit and, like... Yeah. 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 And then... That may be too yeah. generous a reading. I think it is, honestly. Because <laughs> uh, uh, this is where we get into like the male gaze, like everything yeah. that we do, even if women are supposedly going to be reading yeah. these books, yeah. is nonetheless designed for the male gaze. But when, right. when the thing that I found sort of most damning about it all was that I, I looked at these covers over, you know, like 10 covers by an author. After women won awards, their covers changed to mm. look like the men's covers. Oh, wow. 
women had to earn the serious cover. Ah, like they had wow. to somehow break that through and prove it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it was, it's infuriating anyway. So sorry, that was a big tangent side note, but it, I think that's, well, I think I it's feel- relevant. So to bring it back to the, the yeah. story of failure, there is also this thing about how to engage with, like I have these very two distinct impulses because one is, and I think this is like, there's a strategic and a tactical level with all this stuff. It's like, it is systemic. And it is like, there's a machine of sexism here, which is clearly what you're up against. And that's like a strategic view, which is really important. But as an individual author, like just trying to get by in the world, it can be self-defeating to have this view, like there is an implacable edifice of uniform uh, sexism, because yes. And on the other hand, my other impulse is like, wow, you should have found another editor early. (laughs) Like like literally just someone else would have helped, right? I mean- And I didn't know that was an option. I I will say like a few years ago, I was at a panel and with like five editors, Ellen Datlow, Sheila Williams, et cetera. And somehow I ended up telling this story and they said, you know, this doesn't always work, but in that situation, you should have asked whether you could be assigned to another editor. They (laughs) might've said no, but you should have asked. And I was like, I did not know that was a thing, right? Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. a decade later, I still didn't realize yeah. that because it's not presented to you as an option, right? And, you know, why would also, why I, mean, be, right? I mean, also just like, it seemed like a dream deal. You had the collection, right. you had the, but at some point, like you're not an indentured servant. Like you could give right. back the advance. I mean, right? I mean, I, yeah. Well, so you would spend it, but. <laughs> well, I yeah, I had spent it, but the, so the way and the way it all kind of played out was interesting. So, for those listening, you know, when you when you sign a contract, usually it's you don't get all the money up, uh, up front. So for that sixty, so they paid me twenty five thousand dollars for the short story collection. Um, that did very well in foreign sales. It earned out its advance in foreign sales before it ever uh, even came out in America, uh, which was great. But then it didn't do well in America. It got mm-hmm. glowing reviews and mediocre sales. And I would kind of point to the cover as being a large mm, piece of that. Yep. Like they, they didn't they didn't market it to the right people, right? right like right. they and they people who picked up the book and started reading it, thinking, "Oh, I'm going to get a sexy romp." Yeah. Got like. And it also, fiction, and right? also like, you know? uh, like that, and also the, the the tyranny of averages where they're like, oh, it's white women between 45 and whatever buying all the books, which is like not necessarily each book, like maybe yeah. the average, this isn't the median book. Like if you're right. throwing away your South Asian audience by having too sexualized a cover, like maybe for this book, that's a bad idea. Like... Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm saying I ran up against sexism. I think I, I really did racism probably too. run up against racism too, right? It's a racialized form of sexism, right? So anyway, I, I tend to, you know, I rarely go there, right? Mm. Like when I, when I mess up, when mm-hmm. I have like a story that fails, a book that fails, whatever, my first instinct is to feel like I've done something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like I didn't write a good enough book, right? And it takes me a long time to work my way around to like, maybe there was a little sexism involved here. Maybe there there might have been some racism. I I have a hard time even like like saying it out loud because, you know, Well, and I think there is a, I think there is a, a, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, like to live in, the world and like know what you're up against it is important to recognize that these things are real and on the other hand like to let that get too inside your head can also be a pro like in some ways you have to you have to both like on it's like the two you know two different slips of paper in your left pocket and your right pocket you have to know that there are grand systemic forces Mm -hmm. and that it's not all down to individual destiny and then on the other hand you have to act as if you have complete control of your own fate right like you have to sort of be like but i will you know what i mean and and like there's no other way to in some ways there's no other way to live and not be paralyzed by you know you can get you can get really beaten down i think you know like i often talk to young writers of color young women writers who are who are maybe too they have it too present in their minds yeah the racism and the sexism aspect and 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 there is a way in which like stereotype threat like you if you tell people even if you if you give people a math test and you tell them your marginalized group does not well do well a math test they will do worse and if you say it is completely due to institutionalized like it it, you know is it actually you're just as good as everyone else but it happens to be the case that because Mm -hmm. they still do worse 
Right. It doesn't help. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in a way. Yeah, so yeah. it's there. There is a yeah. I have a friend who uh, talks about race a lot, and like it's it's interesting because she is sort of bewildered at how my narrative of my life has very little racism in it, mm. right? Um, because she's very aware of all of these incidents that have happened to her. And she's like, she's like, how could you not have encountered more racism with your brown skin and whatever else? And I, I do think I was like, I just, it just kind of like flew by me. Like I mostly didn't notice. And maybe that was a choice not to notice on some mm-hmm. level, right? Because if I did start paying attention, it would bog me down. And it's, so, protect- and it's a protective yeah. armor in a way to be in a protective right. armor of oblivion that is, and it's interesting because it's like on the one hand, and I, I wonder about that in some ways in terms of, you know, also in terms of like parenting, I don't know, talking mm-hmm. to kids about what they're subject, like to what extent do you, I mean, it's funny to, I, I wouldn't say there's exactly like a, a Jewish equivalent of the talk, but like there yeah. is a point at which you have to explain the Holocaust to kids, <laughs> like, right. like pretty young, like they're going to write, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a big thing people want to talk about. And so it, yeah. it is kind of a, I remember that, I remember like, I remember the, the, the thing about selecting a children's book that was like at the right level of like, both communicating the information and not being totally paralyzing. Like there's a point at which you have to tell it, yeah, no, there's still people around who want to murder you. Like, <laughs> like it's really high on their agenda to murder you. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying you literally say that to a six-year-old, but there's a way in which it's like, how yeah. do you, yeah, anyway, yeah. So. No, 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 and well, I have the same thing with Sri Lanka and being Tamil and the conflict and, yeah. you know, this whole, like, there, there have definitely been moments during when that was, really flaring badly where I was wrestling with, if I go to Sri Lanka, there are going to be people who will kill me because I am Tamil, right? Mm -hmm. Like they will want to do that. And I'm so disconnected from that. I don't speak the language anymore, et cetera. So on. it's, it's sort of, it's bizarre and shocking that this could be a thing in the world. And And at some point your kids must, you know, your kids are also presumably Tamil enough to get killed in Sri Lanka for being Tamil. So Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Are they like? Yeah. I mean, is that and at, there, at what point does that enter their world? You know what I mean. And yeah. On the one hand, you want to shelter them from it, and 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 I should say, like as a upper middle class white Jewish guy, I have the privilege of. I mean, it would be very different if you were black and American. It's not like you can. It's like you're like, well, yeah. should we only tell them when they're like, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're not. It's not an option to not to not for that not to be a conversation. But it is. Yeah. But it is. It is an odd. You know. I mean. I. But I think also, and uh, you know, in that context it's also like how do you how do you how do you leaven how do you strike a balance between like um like arming yeah. people but with foreknowledge and also uh not allowing that to overwhelm their individual sense of individual agency and individual sense of self well that and i think that leads in pretty well to where i was at the end of this process right so I, it had been a year i'd written the book and revised it four times and we decided to part ways. And so um, that $60,000 had been broken up into 25,000 on signing, 25,000 on on acceptance and 10,000 on publication, which is Mm -hmm. a pretty standard sort of division. And um, so we never got to phase two of acceptance, right? Like they never, there was no acceptance there. And so I get to keep my first $25,000 in a sort of interesting conditional way, because Mm. if I sold the book to somebody else, Mm. I had, I was required, legally obligated to pay back HarperCollins, my advance. Oh, interesting. Um, So so I think that's in fact still true. And that's interesting about like, to what extent is it the same book? Like if you write it over using none of the same words, but... You know, to, uh, to I mean, how, I, I, how, uh... I would say I wouldn't be too worried about, you know, at this point, if I go back to that novel, which I may or may not, it would be so different. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it really is the same book. But it, but in that next year, we did try to sell it elsewhere, right? And so if someone had picked it up, yeah. and it was, it was sort of fascinating, because like, we tried it at a bunch of different places. And the, like, you know, the, the gay publishers, it wasn't gay enough for them. It was, mm-hmm. you know, like the romance people, it was definitely not romance enough for them. Yeah. The, so it was a, it, it, it was a little bit of an outlier. They, they liked the writing, but, you know, and uh, so anyway, it was an awful year that the, you know, the, the end result of it all was that I didn't write for 
a good year afterwards. And I'm not someone who is prone to depression, mm-hmm. but I, in, in retro, and I didn't see it at the time, but in, but looking back, I'd say I was probably pretty depressed that year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still teaching. I had, you know, another year on one of my teaching contracts and that was all going along. Okay. Um, but, and I was also dealing with some health things that might have impacted with fibroids, which might have impacted fertility. So I was 35 and suddenly mm-hmm. like kids are book, kids are book, yeah. you know, like had become an acute sort of thing. And I'd always said like, well, I want to write one good book first um, because if I have kids not having done that, I'm going to resent them, right? Like, oh. I've, I, I didn't want to, yeah. like, be in the position of being like, well, my children stopped me from being a writer, right? Yeah. So, but I kind of got to a point where I was like, okay, well, Bodies in Motion, it didn't do great in it's American have sales. To be that <laughs> but yeah, like, it did, it did well with reviews. I'm happy with the writing. It did come out with a big publisher. Yeah. I made some money. I paid off my student loans, you know, so let's let's call it, Let's, let's call, call it. And, and then I, so then we tried to get pregnant and that happened very fast. And I had mm-hmm. caveat the next year. Um, and so I don't know, like, and when did it you was, start it, writing? Again? When she was a baby, I, I was wearing her on my chest. I remember in the little baby Bjorn and I was typing around her and I started writing this fantasy novel. I feel um, like the most productive like I ever was, was on <laughs> paternity leave with Aviva and a baby Bjorn. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's good, right? Because you can't do very much. You just sit there right? and you're right? like, And there's yeah. something amazing about babies, yeah. like this mellowness or this, I mean, obviously they're a lot of work and they're crying and they're fussing, mm-hmm. but like, but like I am constantly tormented by like not being sure like as a sort of chronic background pattern of my life, not being sure I'm doing the right thing, not being sure mm-hmm. that I'm like fulfilling my destiny on the planet. You know what I mean? Like, is this, yeah. is this the book I should be writing? Is this the, should yeah. I, is this at all what I should be doing? Should I be somewhere else doing something more important? And that like, that voice was quiet. Like there's a baby, which is like, clearly this is the most important. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's upset, you know, you need to do something. And if she's happy on your chest, that is like an enormous reinforcement that I was like oh I am doing I am just where I'm supposed to be like that was uh you know that that was uh anyway I agree (laughs) (laughs) you're making you're making me miss it now I'm like no you had a hard first uh I mean, you've talked yeah. about that in your guest of honor speech. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I, yeah, I did not is, actually, yeah. for, for the most part, I did not, uh, I didn't handle lack of sleep well. That's really yeah. what it was, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I, I do, in yeah. fact, there's I think a lot in, of in, that. The, in this, in the, and I still don't handle it well. Like the other, yeah. earlier this week, I had a night where I didn't sleep well and it wrecked me for the next yeah. day. Yeah, I just, yeah, yeah. I just, I need my eight hours. So mm-hmm. um, Kevin has a lot of insomnia and somehow like he manages you know, like yeah. he didn't sleep two nights ago and he still made us all dinner yesterday. And I was like, yeah. how did you do this? I was like <laughs> a wreck. You know, I was lying in bed demanding someone bring me huh. soup. Right. So, right. <laughs> you know. Anyway. Yeah. So that's a so, sensitivity, which is not so, going well with new new parenthood. New parenthood was was a nightmare, honestly. So but but in the times where I had gotten enough sleep, I did manage to write and I, I started writing this fantasy novel, which also didn't sell. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole nother story, but um, I don't know, like, I, I guess I wanted to do this episode and talk about the failure and how crushing it was. And I, I was sort of hoping that I'd be able to articulate something about, like, how do you come back from that? How do you come back from crushing self-doubt is, I think, what I had after I'd done so badly trying to write a novel, mm. right? And that was a big unitary, I mean, you had done, like, you had, like, not had crushing self-doubt so much before that like you came out of like you had been you just came off the bat and you came out of essentially what would today be fan fiction like right you were writing for for the love like in on back in college and then like like, but but already having readers like out there like in usenet Mm -hmm. and then like writing things and just having a lot of early like yeah i had a lot of of self-doubt yeah and then this was sort of the cliff yeah yeah, I think it, falling off a cliff is is absolutely what it felt like. I, w- I would say there was there was the earlier cliff, which was the Clarion experience mm, yep. of yep. 
being feeling like I'd been booted right. out of science fiction, right? right. So like right. that was, um, but at least I had mainstream lit to fall back on, right? Right. right. You know, right. You you know exiled, I, and then you were, and then there too, you were, yeah. And then I was kicked out of there, and so then I was like, well, you know, and and I don't, I don't, I don't think I have any like. Answers. Well, let, I, how about I'll go? I'll yeah. do my failures, and in the meantime, your you'll come yeah, up with your with your, up. your uh your grand takeaway. Um, I don't know. So as you, I mean, I, and I don't think I have quite. I mean, I, like I said, the big cliff is really early, right? Like yeah. the big cliff was like I abandoned. Like writing was my dream from when I was small, in a way, and then like I abandoned it sophomore year, and I spent a ten of college. Like I went cold turkey because it was turning me into a jerk like a bitter <laughs> jealous jerk and i was like i'm not signed up for that so i stopped writing and i came back to it this is the short version we've talked about this before but like at 27 once i had stability in my life i was like engaged i was a computer programmer i had had some adventures like i was like this is who i am and i don't necessarily need to be good at being a writer to have a self you know what i mean yeah. this is like extra this is gravy and then at that point instead of feeling like I had to do something grand and important and, you know, um, the great American novel, like I just went back to the things that gave me joy. You know, I just wrote science fiction and, and, and cool, wacky, like, irrealist experimentation. I just had fun. And, you know, then that I sold and that felt like, yay, this is just all gravy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is all like I already I, I I published something in fantasy and science fiction, which I'd read growing up on my 30th birth. The check came on my 30th birthday. I was like, I win. That's it. I won. Yeah. I, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. And and so everything after that, you know, in a way was like so. But yeah. on the other hand, like I had there's been a lot of failures in the sense that there have been a lot of like things that collapsed. I mean, I, I you know, I I there there. Like the first novel that I wrote was a collaboration with an old friend that I'd started really around that time that I was writing, you know, publishing my very first short stories. Um, mm -hmm. And that took some years and it died. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just how, don't ever. How, how did it I think it, die? it just never became a book that I wanted to. It was never, it never, I mean, we didn't even ever send it out anywhere. I never mm -hmm. felt satisfied with it. I felt like it. I don't know how to write a novel yet. And it was very Baroque. It was very good learning experience. I mean, learned a lot. I mean, one thing is that I, I tend to do, I tend, I, my natural length is short stories. And so in the beginning, the, the book had a lot of cool chapters, but a lot of them were like, you ended the chapter and you're like, that was done. I don't know why I would go on. You know what I mean? Like there was too yeah. much closure. Like every chapter was a short story. Then there was no particular need to go on. I had to learn to open it up and get messier. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it was a very, very complicated plot, lots of characters, and we just never, I don't know, it just never cohered entirely. And I think mm -hmm. I lost patience. I think I, I grew so much as a writer from the time I began it to the time I ended it, that even though I had a draft, which I could, with a lot of work, have gone and, like, gone back and revised, I also have a tendency with collaborators that I'm really excited about collaboration in the beginning, and then at a certain point, if it goes long enough, I'm like, L move away, let me have the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just took over, and, but, but I, um, you know, I don't think that project was entirely a failure because A, I learned a lot, and B, we we mined some short stories out of it. So I sold two short stories, mm -hmm. Stray and King of the Jinn. Um, yeah. I'm pretty happy with Stray. With King of the Jinn, I have some. I have some. I don't know if it's exactly regret. I have some. I feel like there's a certain uh, there's some cliche bullshit in King of the Jinn that that I did mm -hmm. not get out. Um, beforehand and uh which is interesting i got it rejected from clark's world by nick mamatas i love nick mamatas's rejections i used to i used to sort of secretly hope he would reject things just because it's reject and like rather than accept them <laughs> just because the rejections are so good that i'd like go sell it elsewhere but i'd have the anyway he eviscerated my concept there and i think quite <laughs> rightly so um but i went and sold it anyway um but uh but uh but I like, but but story I think holds up better. Anyway, so, and I think that was just, I mean, I don't, it, I, that wasn't devastating. It was hard because it was so much work gone down the drain. Mm -hmm. But I think I also could kind of book it as like, well, I'm learning, you know, I don't know what I'm yeah. doing. Like that's, you know, this is, you know, I didn't necessarily expect this to succeed. I mean, it was, I, I liked the characters and I liked that, you know, it was a loss. Like it's a loss mm -hmm. to like be like, I guess this isn't going to happen. It feels a little like a stillborn, you know what I mean? Like it mm -hmm. never really, I, I yeah. put my heart into it. It never saw the light of day. There was a, there was a, some grief there, but I also felt like my expectations were not 
I don't think I had that. I mean, I think you had a double whammy of like having the novel fail and also like having irreconcilable differences, being hit with racism and sexism, and also like this had been this like the heavens opened up, massive yeah. advance, step through this gate, you will be a, a writer, you know, like a, a, a successful yeah. whatever. And I, I this was like I think I think I've always I mean, there was I'll say like that. I went out to New York after signing the contract and they took me out champagne. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really was, there was a, there was a moment of like, here I am, I'm not quite 35 years old and I have, I'm living the writerly dream. Right. And so then, then that got yanked away. And that so. is, and that is a danger. And I have to say, Oh, I have another thing that is, it's interesting. I, the thing is I have managed to protect myself quite intentionally from being in the position. I always have quite one, I've always been resistant to the idea of selling something on, on uh, you know, on an outline. Mm. You know what I mean? Precisely because I didn't want to get, I know myself, I don't want to get in the position. And this may happen. I mean, I'm not saying, never say never. never. Like as I become a right. more, hopefully, God willing, I'll become, I have a little more professionalism under my belt. I'll be able to do such a thing. But I often, I felt like it was dangerous for me to set up the structure of expectation that I didn't know I could deliver on. I, I definitely wanted to yeah. finish the book and then sell it, not the other way around. And, and I, um, <laughs> And so I don't think, I, at least this, there was a grief and a loss to doing the book, but I had promised to no one but myself, you know, and my collaborator. Like, I, di I didn't know if it was going to work, and I never knew, I had not, you know what I mean? So wait, it wasn't like this, there wasn't this crash of being, like, um, that overwhelmed by the magic, having the magic ticket and then losing it. I was always, yeah. like, it was always in private, in my own little yeah. world, that this was happening. And I mean, also with the unraveling, like, there were so many moments i mean that book was like 10 years and like multiple revisions and it was a whole it went through a whole two-year cycle with one agent revising it to what she wanted and then eventually she walked away from it so there was a lot of like there's a lot and i think i i looked at my spreadsheet there was like 29 agents i queried with the unraveling anyway wow. um you know, 29 rejections and then there was a lot more agents who i like either researched or whatever decided against anyway i, I did a i did a massive like uh agent hunt which took like three years but um uh, we should talk about agents at some point because our processes have been so different. Yeah. Um, so let's wait. We'll wait but until I my. Say, yeah. What I wanted to say about this moment where you're talking about it being overwhelmed of this, like being fatayed as like the hot new thing and then crashing. I have to say the most similar, like in some ways, a lot of the anguish in my career has not actually been from failures, but more from successes. <laughs> like, like I have an odd structure where I get. Uh, I, I, and I've, I've had to try to articulate this, but often when good things happen, I get anxious. You know what I mean? Like, like, sure. So the, the hard, I would say the hardest month. It's a, it sounds very evil eye ish, but go on. Very right? like, Jewish. Very yeah, Jewish. Yeah. Thought pattern. <laughs> you know. Exactly. The yeah. evil eye yeah. is coming. So <laughs> the worst, probably the worst month in my, yes, my shadow ancestors are, are, you know, <laughs> hovering over me as they say this. The, probably the worst, the hardest, psychologically hardest month. And it's not stupid when I say this. And it, it, you know, it's okay. like people are like nice problem to have. But like the the hardest month probably of my writing career w emotionally was like I got nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula in the same mm -hmm. year for two different stories. And I felt <laughs> elated and unmoored. You know what I mean? Like I like yeah. a little floating. Like and I was like, the, you know, the, and all that, like, like this sort of like glitz of like, this is it, you know, the great. And yeah. like I and and enervated, like sort of like too running at too high a speed. Yeah. Like not that. And of course, like, you know, not that I don't know, like I don't actually believe that award. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think the things that win awards are necessarily better than things that don't win awards. It's very much a crapshoot in the popularity there's, contest. There's a lot mean, going on. That's that's definitely where imposter syndrome kind of always steps in, right? Like when you get this next level of recognition, I mean, that's a really standard pattern that, oh, people are saying like, I'm this good, yeah, which is better yeah. than they thought before. I now have to live up to I, that. that right? to Am I... Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think there's that. I'm not sure I would precisely say it's imposter syndrome. I, I, I think it's, a, I mean, I, I hesitate to claim that label because I think so many people have so much more i don't know like like reasons for for you know like a lot like like as a white guy who was brought up to on some level believe that i should be at the center of the universe i don't know that it's quite the same phenomenon but yeah there is this uh, there's there's no um, no no wait I'm, i want to stop and i disagree like yeah i really don't think so right like i mean i think 
you know, there, there are ways in which imposter syndrome can get inflected by race and gender and whatever else, right? But I think, put all that aside, it is a thing in and of itself, right? If you were in a universe that was only white guys, you'd still have the same problem of when you, when you, and in my experience, and I think this is pretty common, it's a little counterintuitive because people expect that you have to struggle with imposter syndrome less as mm-hmm. you become more right. successful in your career. Yes. And that it is the inverse, right? Like the the further along you go, the more prestigious, the sure. more the more the degrees, voice, whatever, yeah. right? The the bigger the the gap potential gap is and the further you have to fall. And I think it's very it's totally re- I was just talking to Cadwell Turnbull about this on mm-hmm, Facebook, mm-hmm, yeah. right? He was talking about, uh, he's, a, he's a bright young author. His novel, The Lesson, his first novel came out, The Lesson. It's great. It's getting a lot of acclaim. Mm-hmm. And um, he was saying that it's feeling very paralyzing. And mm-hmm. so uh, what I said was, this is, this is normal. This is what you should expect after a big success right. is unless there's, I don't want to say unless there's something wrong with you, but, but, but. <laughs> no, <laughs> unless that, you're that's somehow maybe, immune. Yeah. Unless you're an exception maybe, case. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like, unless you have such an ego that you can't imagine that you aren't that great. Like it's, it's mm. totally normal for, um, for people to feel that backlash, I guess that like, you know, like, well, oh, just, they, they think I'm better than I am. Right. I and just then want to point gotta... to, I think there's two different things because I think there, okay. I think when people so classically have talked about imposter syndrome, they're mm-hmm. talking about, a, 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 like, I think that there's one kind of thing, which is like, if you enter into an environment where you did not sort of expect to be there or you're fighting against people's perceptions or your, or your, you know, of, 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 sure. of should you be there, that there's this internalized voice that's like, I shouldn't be here, which is in, for some people, I think sort of, a, and I've, you know, I know people for whom that's sort of a continual struggle. Like it may get worse, it may get better, but there's always sure. this sense of like, I'm, def, you know, like I am, I am like, there's something anomalous about my being here or whatever. Um, right. And I think that there are some ways in which I am not necessarily subject to that in the same way. I don't fight that daily sure. the way that I think some of my friends do, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I see that. I, maybe we need two different terms. But there's another I, term, I, which I, is a universal human reaction, which right. I think is is definitely like I am not immune to and like had in spades. And I also think, as a third thing, that there is a very specifically uh, – a, a, a very specific way in which it's like inflected by being precisely by being a unstably upper middle class Jewish man, because, because. well, because, because my son, the doctor, right? So it's not mm-hmm. like, it's not like, it's not like the world expects you to be crap and not excel. It's actually like um, you, you, your excelling might save us from the pogrom. Do you know what I mean? Like you're <laughs> like like you are our shot. And there's this very I mean, you know, that's a that's a whole other a whole yeah, other yeah, rant, yeah. but there's this very interesting cultural pattern. I was reading about the I was reading about the um the intellectual also the class issues of like the intellectual pressure in the shtetl, where, you know, in the shtetl, there's this hermetically sealed world of like this is the little little market towns that my ancestors grew up in. Jewish learning was this huge huge thing. Like you wanted to marry. Like if you if you could marry your daughter to a rich guy, that was okay. But if you married to a rabbi, like a rabbi had written a treatise yeah. in the Talmud, that was way better, right? It was like it was like mm-hmm. it was like you know. I mean I mean uh, and so um, there was this clout, and they were convertible one to the other. You know what I mean? In certain sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. like like almost a hereditary scholastic achievement, and. The odd thing is, this is an entirely internal Jewish conversation. Nobody else cares. Like, you're in a world, the police who are going to come and, and to burn down your house, they have no idea who studied the Talmud. Like, it's, this is no yeah, yeah, reality yeah. outside of this tiny little culture. But it's sort of what's keeping the culture stitched together across an enormous geographical space where it has no political power, right? So, so like, this, you know, like, the fact that rabbis, you know, are, are sending letters arguing with each other from, like, Spain to 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 Morocco to you know Cairo to Baghdad about like weird little points of law that nobody else in the world would have any idea about. But that's like your but the I the, just the description of like and also how this is inflected by sexism. The description of how like if you're you know the little boy like 
being called up to like recite Talmud because the idea was that if he could, you know, everybody else should probably slave away to send him to Talmudic Academy so he could right. like be buried in books. And, and, and the fact that this is sort of, there's this enormous anxiety and that essentially it's like you could flourish and then everything could be lost. And my family also, my family's class position is also interesting because it's like a whole very typically Jewish series of like making a lot of money and then losing it all and being driven mm. out and then making a lot of money again and then losing it all. I don't know. So like that, and that's a very, that like, and this is, this is sort of classically like one reason, there's a long digression and we can edit this no, on no, a different no, no, section no, if we great. want, but there's a way in which anti-Semitism is not just another kind of racism. It's, you know, the, what, when we argue about whether I'm white, it's like racism yeah. is designed to terrify, brutalize, and subjugate large numbers of people so that their labor is available to be, and their bodies are available to be pillaged. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what racism as it developed under colonialism is for. Right. And anti-Semitism is not for that. There's not that many Jews, and like sending them out to the field to work is not that much of a win. The mm -hmm. point of anti-Semitism since the, since the year 1000 is like to develop a set of vulnerably vulnerable quasi elites who you can scapegoat right it's for scapegoating it's not for exploitation it's not for pillaging it's for scapegoating so like it's like it's like when things get bad and the people rebel you can point to the jews and be like the jews they're the rich they're yeah. the ones who've been explaining then you go down to burn down the jews houses and, and then the, the you know the people actually in charge are like phew that was good we diverted the mob <laughs> there's a there's a sign there's like a there's like the yeah, actual yeah. masters of the universe are living in their mansion and there's a sign pointing to like the shuttle yeah, yeah, like, yeah. actually they're rich over there um anyway so this so, level so of insecurity wait, wait, wait. yeah well i, I want to before we go off this like now i'm i'm trying to think how this connects to like s the british colonizing in south asia right because you know certainly there were yeah people drafted into their military who were sent off to be cannon fodder. There were people working the plantations and so on, right? The yeah. indentured servants. So there was that level of physical labor, but they did also have, you know, Indian doctors were allowed to keep mm -hmm. being doctors, Indian judges, Indian lawyers. And there was, that was part of the rhetoric of colonization, right? Like part of the, justification was that there was always this bribe this lure hanging out here see some of your people get to do well and also the and white then, man's burden it was an internal justification right, that we're right, elevating right. And, you know that's right so we're gonna we're gonna people. we're gonna there is going to be a path to independence for yeah, you yeah. and eventually you will get to be maybe our equals right yeah. like that the mandate that we are nurturing you until you've developed to the stage of Right, so that's like the, the 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 promise and the the threat of colonization, and it it's I'm just thinking like how it plays out in my family is you know to some extent my you know my grandfather was the principal of a school, my father was a doctor, that's what let us move to the U.S., and I was supposed to be a doctor too. My younger sisters are both doctors, right? And so I think if I'd stayed in that framing. I think it would have been, um, I don't know, like that's, that is the kind of success I was supposed to have. And it, yeah. it, it, it may be, I would have still had some imposter syndrome. I think I know my, I, I'm sure my sisters have encountered racism in the hospitals where they've gone into work, but at least, you know, there's, there is an assumption of model minority stuff in America where, I, I was at a I was at a science fiction convention in Philly at one point, and it was in the same hotel as a medical <laughs> convention. I can see where this and is going. <laughs> all through the con, the hotel staff right. like I'd, I'd come. Kept they'd steering have, you to the had, doctor's convention where you belonged. <laughs> they literally addressed me as doctor, right? Like it's like, hello, right. doctor, can I help you? And I was right, like, right, not a know, doctor, is, not a doctor. I'm a 22 year old sci fi geek. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 you yeah. know, yes, um, right, it was, right. It was. But that was the base assumption, right? So it's it's. I wouldn't say it's it's and clearly that's, that's not. A, that's clearly like a thing encoded into the American cast system. Like if you cast somebody for yeah. a sitcom to be like the doctor delivering the bad news, right? You're going to make them one of these model minority. Right. So it's anyway. It, that's but yeah, all. A but bit I think there... tangent, but I, well, I guess what I was going to say is I do think I kind of got to sidestep mm. some of that 
by becoming a writer instead mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's so far outside the <laughs> Sri Lankan American experience. Yeah. Like there's no, yeah. no expectations, right? right. Like right. Interesting. any, any success I have, the most minor thing, like publishing a poem, right. is it's like, shockingly oh my gosh. brilliant. Right. Like no one's ever done that, right? Like you know, so that's yeah. uh, that may have contributed to my ego, right? In yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, like like, like sort of insulated me a little bit in those early well, years. So what I was going to say about the way that this sort of multi generational pattern of it's a very distinct pattern of internalized oppression yeah. interfacts with it's not it's not sort of garden variety uh, imposter syndrome or it's another kind of thing. It, it's not so much that I feel like oh I shouldn't be here, but I think there is this sort of um, anxiety around success. And I think the part of the way this is communicated multi-generationally is I know that, I mean, not to throw my parents under the bus, it's not their fault, it's a multi-generational systemic pattern. But I think that there's this way in which the my son, the doctor kind of praise, like I got a lot of praise. And mm -hmm. it, there, but a lot of it was sort of anxiety making, sort of strings attached at least mm. the message I got was a certain amount, there's a certain amount of anxiety attached, like your success is the thing we're all banking on. I mean, in a way, right. you know what I mean? Like there's that implicit, I think, cultural yeah. message. And and I feel like it's um, uh, it, it, because of the fact that anti-Semitism is around scapegoating and also intercession. So there's this long tradition, like Maimonides, the great Jewish philosopher and also, uh, you know, um, legal authority, Jewish legal authority of the Middle Ages was also like the do court doctor to the to the uh, the the Sultan of Cairo. I'm not sure if Sultan is the right word. The the, the reigning you know guy in Cairo. I think it's at one point to um, uh, Saladin. Mm -hmm. I think Saladin discussed like loaning Maimonides to Richard the Lionheart during a truce in the Crusades. Anyway, that was like, and there's a way in which it's like he's the, and that's like a, such a classic pattern. In fact, it's in the Book of Esther. Like Mordecai okay. is like this, you know, advisor to the king, and therefore manages to be there in the right place at the right time to like save the people from getting massacred because sure. he has the the ear of the king. And there's this, uh, you know. And I want to say, I think Guy Gabriel K. That was central to his novel, The Lions of Al Rasan. Ah, yeah, yeah. A beautiful sure. novel, sure. so I recommend it. Like the Kindat in there are the Jews, right? Um, he has this, uh, you know, pseudo Europe that he writes about in his fantasy novels, and they, yeah. there's exactly that scenario plays out in in that book. And so I think there's this, and I think there's this sort of outsized sense of like how great it's really important that you be. You know, yeah. which is sort of like looming, which is almost like it's almost like an inverse imposter syndrome. It's not like, well, I shouldn't be here. I'm not. It's like you better be, you know, you better write the great thing like that. That is that our survival rests on you being okay, the so most impressive of whatever you are um, like that. So we should. Anyway, so, so I was going to say <laughs> so we're, we're, that to bring it around to the to. The, so I got nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula. Yeah, and I didn't write for at least a month. I was completely blocked. And it was like this, it was like way too much. And I think a lot of people have this. I was just sort of describing my own cultural variant on the imposter syndrome thing. But I think it is pretty universal that that amount, that, that like sudden attention, even if it's positive, is paralyzing. And I felt like everything, like every, like it, that, in fact, in some ways, that sort of same thing I'd been struggling with sophomore year when I gave up writing, that like everything was portentous and full of destiny, which I hadn't had when I was just like, we, I'm playing. But like getting nominated for awards was all of a sudden like everything I every the next word you write okay like you got 249 words done it's time to type the 250th word but is it the right word you know, like is it so Im like is it going to be worth and it's much of what you said like can you justify yeah. like now everyone is expecting of you now everyone thinks of you that you have this you know can you justify and and anyway so uh, so it's odd that like when I think about I feel like I want to ask experiences. Ted. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. They're not necessarily failures. Well, Sometimes they're successes or almost successes or whatever. No, when I lost sense. those nominations, when I didn't get the Hugos, I felt it was a so release. immense. Really, oh my god, oh my god, I felt so good. <laughs> I feel like I want to ask Ted Chang about this. Oh my, right? I because... think it's crippling for Ted Chang. I, I do. I, I wonder, you know, like, because right now, I think people sort of expect that every short story he publishes will win an award. And that's got to be hard, right? Yeah, like, I the, mean, and that's, you know? well, and when I wonder how it changed after Arrival, because that was also like, yeah. that was already a huge pressure. Bef I mean, Ted and Kelly, I think yeah. there's this huge pressure because they're so, their stuff is so jewel-like and there's so little of it and it's so acclaimed that like, I think that does make it harder. And yeah. I, 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 but I wonder whether, I wonder whether Arrival made it, better or worse you know what i mean like yeah. that he is now all of a sudden he's not just our ted chang anymore there's a there's know, a, a wider world expecting yeah. things from him anyway that's that's very tough i don't know um 
I want to, I have a logistical question and a, and a meaty question. So logistically, this is when we normally wrap up and I didn't know whether you had to run out the door. Um, if you don't, I want to ask. I don't have to run out. I, I'm now checking my texts and I don't have to run the door. Um, a, I, uh, oh wait, or do I? Oh no, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will, I have time. Uh, okay. so, just gonna... I have a, so I want to get back to um, the question of like, how do you come out of mm -hmm. the, the moments that paralyze you? Yeah. That can maybe wait for the next time record because I, the, I, I, I am curious about whether you, whether you feel like your anxiety about success ever hobbles you from attempting um, the big thing. Hmm. Has it, you know, like, I think it constantly no. hobbles me, like yeah, constantly. But I, but I don't know that it's on the macro level. I feel like it's far more an impediment to writing the next word than it is to taking on the big, big project. project. Well, I'm not really? sure what taking on means because there's lots of like grand projects that I have like a page yeah. of notes and you know, uh, you know what I mean. Like I, I mean, it, it, but but I. So I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily hobble me from like ideation and like sketching out and embarking on. I love embarking on. Like I'll embark okay. on anything. But like when it gets hard, I think is when uh I don't know, like there... when it gets hard, it gets hard, right? As soon as the, the first energy of like enthusiastically also, I don't know what the big projects are. Like I don't know in advance. Like I you know what I mean? Like like I, I think we've we've said this before on this. It's like some of the things I think that actually hold up really, that I've done that hold up really well as being kind of like insightful and moving the needle forward are the, precisely the things that were started as total like larks full of in jokes sure. and bullshit. And some of the things that I thought were grand, important, yeah. you know, like uh, projects that would echo through the ages, I look back on and I'm like, yeah, whatever. So, I mean, it's not, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, first of all, I, I'm very bad at judging what's important or what's big or what's whatever. But I also think that, um, and I'm not sure it's a good avenue for me to bark down even, but I also think that uh, it's very much an impediment. My anxiety is very much an impediment where as soon as I don't know what to do, as soon as the initial enthusiasm flags, I uh, can be paralyzed by self-doubt yeah. or the anxiety. I think yeah. it's interesting because I don't think that's my pattern, right? Like, if anything, I maybe have... I don't know the, the opposite problem. I don't, you know, the, I was the kid who every report card said, Marianne does not live up to her potential. <laughs> every single life. Mm -hmm. Semester after semester, it must've driven my parents crazy. And now I would say that there was some undiagnosed ADD involved in that. And, yeah. you know, that's fine. But, um, like it, it, it did sort of bewilder people, yeah. my teachers, that I would like do poorly on science science tests when I would be able to talk articulately in class, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I think that was was probably ADD related. But then, but but kind of like on a on a broader like dream big level, you know, when I was um, applying to my PhD program, I had to ask for recommendation letters. And my one of my letters, you know how you like sign something saying you're not going to look at them? For whatever reason, I didn't sign at that time. Mm. And I looked at them. I think I was really craving like mm, an honest validation. evaluation. Yeah. Uh -huh. something. Or, or an honest evaluation. Right? Yeah. Something. Well, no, I actually probably was craving validation because at that point. Now I kind of want an honest evaluation. Yeah. But but back then I went validation uh -huh. because I read this letter and it was a positive letter, but uh -huh. the one line that stuck out was something about how Marianne thinks she's better than she is. She re yeah, I mean, she, she phrased it nicer than that, but it was a little bit like, I think what she was trying to get at was that she saw me as reaching for a claim, expecting a claim that uh -huh. I had not yet, that I hadn't yet earned. earned yeah. And at the time, it made me really angry. In yeah. retrospect, I think it's probably accurate. I think it was a, a fair assessment because I was, I think I've always been sort of very aware of like the potential of 
these big ideas and I get caught up in them. And this is why I start magazines and science mm-hmm. fiction foundations. Like, you know, like I get annoyed that there wasn't a travel grant for me. And so I start a 501c3 <laughs> arts foundation, right? Like yeah. that's a, an unusual response, right? <laughs> so, so, um, and then it leads to struggle. Like right now I have this like, this portal and project at the SLF where I'm like, I really want it to be like Khan Academy, but for creative writing. Mm-hmm. And I can see, yeah. I can see this vision of the You're big of thing vision. it would be. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's been a huge struggle because in fact, to get there, like to do it right, it could eat my life, you know, yeah, I'd sure. give all my hours over to it and I'm not willing to do that. And so instead it's like, stop and start, stop and start. And like, very slowly accreting towards something. Um, there's only so many big visions you can play out, but I, yeah. I guess as I was listening, I, mean, I don't think. I mean, talk, you, you and I it are. Sounded, it sounded like you were maybe like. I, I, it made me wonder whether you hesitate to even reach for the big vision, right? And I know you've just finished this big novel, so like maybe, maybe you, maybe, maybe that one you managed and you've like fought through it. Right. But I yeah, wonder, I mean, it, made, it made me wonder whether it was a, a pattern overall. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I Again, I'm not even sure I know what, which one's the big, I, I mean, I think that, I think a similarity, I mean, you are, you do a lot of things that are bigger in scale. You, you, you know, you, you, you have this pattern of <laughs> starting organizations, which is, which yeah. is, uh, which is, is interesting. And, um, but I think we're similar in some ways in the sense that it's like we have we are consumed with like there are so many visions that there's only one life and like we're we're I think both of us mm-hmm. feel constantly torn that it's like I could be doing all of these different things. There's yeah. all these things that are demands on my attention. And I don't but I'm not sure I mean when you use the word big, I am honestly not sure. I could rattle off right now a list of the ten or twelve works of fiction that I think I should be pursuing simultaneously, like that I've started, <laughs> that I have an idea for, that I think are cool. I don't know which ones are big and which ones are small. I don't even know how to parse that. Well, but maybe... Like number of that words? Not, it, but, is that all you no, mean? No, 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 not at all. No, <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, you know, so did we talk about this? There is a, there is this conversation that um, William Gibson had with... Oh, I'm going to forget his name. I feel so bad. He's a, he's another wild cards writer and I'm just blanking right now, but he was, he tells this story about he and William Gibson were like at a bar in the early whatevers and talking about how they were both going to write books. And the, the guy speaking is like, Oh yeah, I'm going to write a book that's, you know, like a good novel, right? I don't know, something, something like uh-huh. a manageable goal, right? And William Gibson's like, I'm going to write something that revolutionizes the field. And right. then he went out and, and wrote Neuromancer and revolutionized the field, right? So that's that's kind of what I mean by... But is by is that by how me. that... What I mean is, is that how that... First of all, two questions. Well, and the, and the, and the, way the, guy, the way the guy tells the story is that, like, like well, he tells sure. it as, like, I didn't dream big enough, right? Like, Gibson set this ridiculous goal for himself but then that yeah, made a like space for him problem. to do it <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, don't know. I, mean, I guess I, I i guess i'm wondering like if you've got these 12 projects why are you not you know on an island somewhere with a guru i mean i'm being ridiculous here but you know what i mean like why is that not the burning question in your heart right now as well, to like the, oh you mean which one is that the yeah, question? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, mean, I guess. In some way, that is always the burning question in my heart. But that, but that is, and that's what I'm often paralyzed by. But I think that it's partly a function of, I, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think big is a healthy question for me. I think it's actually hmm. a toxic question for me. Precisely what I'm saying. Which one yeah. will save the people? Which one of these yeah, projects yeah, yeah, will yeah. get me the ear of the king so that when they come to kill <laughs> us, I will be the one that, that's the question in my head, right? Right, and it's a right. stupid ass question. Do you know what I mean? It's a yeah. stupid ass question because that isn't where what I'm good at comes from. Like the, the story that I've written that reached the most people is the orange. It's 300 mm-hmm. words long. You teach yeah. it. I, do. I don't know. So like, so, I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, is it big? 
<laughs> I think it's big. It makes me, you know, every time I read it and teach it, I it makes me stop and think about whether I ought to be religious or not. I mean, yeah, I, I think, think it's huge. Right? That's huge. Exactly. I think it's big. I think it's ambitious. The way yeah. I wrote that story was I here's how I wrote the orange. I was like. I'm feeling paralyzed about writing a good story. I don't know how to write a good story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 20 crappy stories really fast without yeah. stopping to think. And I wrote 20 stories down, like just the most absurd line I could think of. Like I just came up with like some crazy ass idea and then like just let my brain go and like it got out of my way, tried to make it work. And one of them was the orange. Like I think three of them were good actually, but like one of them got published in Writer Online back in 2001. Anyway, whatever. The orange is the one that made it big. I didn't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I buy it. To, it's precisely wrong for me to sit down and be like, now I will write something that will make Marianne wonder if she should be religious. That is exactly the wrong tree. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. I, okay, but you're talking about approach. I. I don't know. I th maybe this maybe this is where we start the next time we we meet because I do think that there's a a value to sneaking up on this stuff and sometimes I am you know, always that's... trying to revolutionize the field. That's that's I, I think that I think yeah. is the point here. I can't not try to revolutionize the field. When I wrote a Siege of Cranes, I I'm was trying like to save, I'm trying to save humanity. So you know like I, you know <laughs> so, that too. No, 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 I mean no, no, no. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't I'm mostly feeling guilty that I'm not trying to save humanity while trying to but but like when I wrote a siege of cranes, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna write sword and sorcery. I got a rejection from yeah. Black Gate for the White City that was like, what we'd like to see, we like the ideas, what we'd like to see is what we mostly publish is sort of rousing sword and sorcery. And I was like, well, I don't write that. I write big important literary things. And I was like, why not? Why not? Let's yeah. just write yeah. some sword and sorcery. Let's just write like a rune quest campaign from back in the day. Just like like, like, just pure fun. Just like, um, uh, you know, um, what's the word where you wander around? Uh, like, like, um, like a story in which, in which yes, there's no not, not a, plot, one thing a, after it's another. It's a German thing, picaresque. Picaresque. I will just write a picaresque sword and sorcery with lots of cool monsters. That's what I'll write. So I sat down and of course I wrote a, like, uh, you know, elegiac story about grief and fatherhood and like i don't know like with all these you know i don't know in which people like sell their cultural identity and i you know and it's about yeah. I, in which it people are complicit i can't write anything that's just you know what i mean like I, yeah. if i try to write something that's 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 frivolous i can't help but uh you know fuck with it until it is uh you know what I mean? Like until until I think I'm subverting everything that I ever knew. Like I, that's uh, it, yeah, no, and I think we talked about that with you know like the stars change. I set out to write like fun sci-fi erotica, right. and of exactly. course like then... it got it got swallowed up by the Sri exactly. Lankan civil war, right? Exactly. So you know, so yeah, I, maybe so, maybe this isn't a problem. I maybe I'm psychoanalyzing you know, in, where there isn't really an issue. No, I, but think, it did... I think that the, it's, you're, you're dead right that the anxiety is in my way, but I don't, but I think, I think it's, but, but I also think it's your question. I mean, I think in a way you're projecting, because I think it's your question is like, maybe it's a fruitful question for you to be like, which yeah. of these things is ambitious and which of these things is playing it safe. But I don't even know that how I would begin to parse that question. I mean, I have, yeah. a, so one of the stories that I, one of the novels that I feel like I should be writing, one of the 12 is about, is an alternate evolutionary history in which birds domesticate humans. They they develop crows, corvids develop sentience first and domesticate humans, and they blind them so that the humans are more docile. Mm -hmm. The way we castrate cat bulls, mm -hmm. so there are characters who are, you know, integrated well into the the humans are sentient too. There's some that are integrated into the corvid side. They're corvid characters. Right. I don't know. I think that's big. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Like everything is like that. They're all like that. Yeah. 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 Okay, so maybe it's maybe it's. You but know, I don't know where I, to go I, with that story. I don't know what the right. next move is. I sort of wrote. I wrote. A, I wrote a beginning of a story, and I'm like, I don't know. You know, yeah. I don't know how to operationalize it. I don't know who the. I don't know who the characters are. I don't know I, what that. I, I, yeah. Something's missing. I think, my, I, th I think my question was just coming out. I guess it was coming out of two things. One was just when you were talking about stuff, it seemed like you were saying that success frightens you, and that made me wonder whether you. Um, whether you might avoid success on some level, right? Like, um, and sure, a, but not by avoiding and a, and a, starting. 
<laughs> it's right. not very well, scary to embark. Starting. It's not scary right. to embark on something big because I'm very comfortable. I'm very comfortable with unachieved potential. I'm very comfortable with the idea that there's this grand thing that were I only to finish it, I would be amazing. But alas, I could not fit. That's very comfortable. God. God, that makes me crazy. I can't, <laughs> I can't in my own work, it's fine for you. But like, I'm like, I, I hate having, you know, 40 things in process that are, you know, like. Well, not, I don't think it's not, good for me, but it's yeah. definitely like a pattern that I am naturally comfortable with. So the, I mean, I think the answer is it's not right. It, I, I think I, I think I, I think there's a element to this anxiety that's self-sabotaging where I, Bulk yeah. I think before, that's what I was trying to get at before yeah. kicking the ball, but I don't think it's about embarking. It's not embark right. embarking's great. Embarking on it's yeah, great. Yeah. And I just have more like unfulfilled potential. That's very comfortable. It's the you know, it's actually I don't know, like I think I flinch at a point where it's like which is why partly I try to outsmart myself by writing, by trying to figure out how I can do things that are lower stakes. It's yeah. gonna be ambitious. It's me writing yeah. it. I can't shut yeah. up. But like yeah. actually lowering the stakes is really like if I can trick myself into thinking this is a lark, I will actually finish something. <laughs> yeah. no, I think and I, I, I think I have some of the same stuff, right? That's why I, I will sometimes be like, I'm just going to write this and it'll be light and it'll be it never ends up light, but it helps to get you past. And so like, how did I come out of that year of depression with the novel? you know, it really was a, well, fine, I'm going to abandon realist, literary, serious fiction. That's hard. I think I, Hunger Games had just hit it big mm -hmm. and I loved it. I mean, I really, I thought, I thought Hunger Games, the, no, the novels were really good. Um, I did really too. Sub subversive, um, which she did in books two and really, three. Really, really bold. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I, I, and even on so screen, I'm, like, I don't remember, I don't know of another, off the top of my head, of another big, um, exciting, consumable science fiction epic where we are clearly walk, watching like a working class person fight back against the complacency, like of the ca of the middle of like the 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 haves. Yeah. And I mean that is, you would think that would be a more common trope, but it is always I mean, like there's... abandoned princesses who have not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, it turns out you're of the noble lineage. I think what I love best about that series, though, is so, yes, book one does that. And the first movie gives you this very satisfying, triumphant ending. And what I what I find really brilliant is that by doing that, she did give you sort of like a satisfying formula, made readers really happy. And that kept us coming back mm -hmm. and then she completely to, subverted it yeah she completely subverted it and she's like it's way more complicated and ambiguous and you're not going to get a happy ending you know and people were kind of mad about it but no uh, that's they brilliant were, they no were, i love i love that they too. were committed right you know yeah. like i was, I was really impressed so anyway so i read yeah. this and i was like i was like okay well i can't do that but i can write a fun fantasy novel and that's what i was trying to do writing the baby around, you know, on my chest and uh, writing around her. And I, I deliberately thought back to Madeline La Engel mm -hmm. and the opening of this fantasy novel. I was like, I'm going to make it like the opening of A Wrinkle in Time. It's going to be in the kitchen and the kids and the food uh -huh. and the storm and whatever uh -huh. else. And wow. that was just such a delight. Yeah. Right. And it, I guess that's, that is what let me start again. So mm -hmm. maybe that's my conclusion to this whole episode is um, for me, each time I've had a big failure, I've had to look for some, some lower stakes source of writer pleasure mm -hmm. to bring me back in. Right? I think to we're like, saying the same thing. Yeah. I, I think, think we're so, saying, right? you know, reach for joy and playfulness and like the creativity does not live in like, your ambition like it's a, right. a, a, in a certain way ambition the like creative ambition is great but but like it's so easy for you, you, have, to, you have to put it aside right and, like and, it can't yeah. yeah or it permeates you anyway but it's like yeah. the, the but the the but you have to you have to return to a childlike space of let's pretend in which the stakes are you know what i mean in which in which it, it, you're you're purely like existing in the joy of the moment to the extent that it's all in order to achieve some some ex, some other pasture 
that you know what I yeah. mean? Like is that that can be like that can be heady and it can be motivating sometimes. But then the downside is that it can be either if you if either if you have six signs of success or failure, like at either event, it can be overwhelming and you've kind of staked your motivation on something outside of yourself that is you know what I mean? Like 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 yeah. that that you're then beholden to well and, and, and the market right and the market is so random and there's so much you know like chance out there that um oh yeah and sexism and racism and anti-semitism and all of that right like you know <laughs> well, how, like, to be fair in publishing i feel like the anti-semitism is mostly internalized <laughs> it's mostly I, in my head i don't know anyway but yeah, I had I had a conversation with a Jewish writer friend of mine who he was adamant that if he wrote a book with a Jewish male protagonist, it was not going to be successful. And well, uh, you know, I can imagine that it's. I I think there's you know publishing is is chock full of Jews. Um, but there is a certain I do notice there's a there's a there's probably something around like you're not being assimilated enough. You're making us look yeah. bad. Like that's definitely like I do have. I I yeah. There's certain sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's not I mean, quite the same thing. I mean, anyway. I'll, I'll put a, I'll put up counter examples like yeah, Michael yeah, yeah. Chabon and what he does is brilliant. But um, well, I, I don't necessarily agree with. I don't necessarily agree with my friend in this assessment, but I think it's interesting that he feels it. Right? That he feels it anyway. And it it has like changed what he chooses to write which is huh. which is which to me is sad right like yeah uh, yeah that's a, yeah, that's, so, that's a whole other conversation about the closet like in a way it's like it's like there's some way in which i feel like i mean i think that sometimes it is necessary to hide really but it's yeah. also at such a cost and it is so yeah. like not yeah like it's it's um uh and it, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so much know, of it so, is. So much of it is in is getting under, you know, things get under your skin and inside your head. I do wonder, like, you and I are are very much in sync on the like, you know, let's 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 stuff down the naked ambition and sneak up on it with fun and joy and playfulness and all of that. Lower the stakes. I'm I'm really curious now, like, if there are other like professional writers out here listening to this, are they all like nodding their heads saying no, yes? No, that's no, I don't the way? think so. I'm sure there's yeah, a lot no, of people for whom who do not have our particular hangups. Like, I think I think, and I no, and I have enormous respect and and admiration yeah. and a little bit of envy. Like, it's you know, talking to John Scalzi about this. I feel like yeah. he has this just sort of very uncomplicated, pleasurable relationship to success, <laughs> <laughs> which I love for him. I mean, yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. he's like, oh, there's this kind of fiction that I miss, that I really like, that I'm good at writing, and that will like I can sell the hell out of. And then he just does yeah. that, and he's really good at it, and it's like, and he enjoys the hell out of doing it. I find that yeah. very heartening and attractive like yeah. i love that he doesn't have the the i mean i i well, well we should get him on and ask but i i i don't get the sense that he has the same i and you know uh scott westerfeld like i don't know i i, I talked to some people and they're just like they just seem to be able to be like i'm gonna write this thing and this is why it will work and this is why it will work for my career and this is why it will work for me creatively and like okay that's gonna take a year you know yeah. badoom badoom i don't know i i yeah, I mean, more power to them, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, like there's this there's this group, twenty books to fifty k, which is um, indie published mm. writers who sort of say like, if you write twenty books generally in a series, mm -hmm. then you can guarantee yourself an income of fifty thousand a year. There you go. I only those, need to right? live like three hundred years, and that'll work out fine. Well, but this is the thing, like they write these books very fast, right? And so yeah. I, like I do I did yeah. my toe in this group occasionally and I'm like, they they're very business like in their approach. They're very um and they're having fun. I mean, they're yeah. loving the writing, right? It's not that they're cranking out something that makes them miserable. Sure. They are in they're enjoying writing these books that their readers love reading and they're serious and they do one after another. But it's it to me it's sort of like, oh, like that approach is, I don't know, like, you know, going to med school or huh. becoming a basketball <laughs> player or something like that. Like what your like parents a, wanted you to do. Well, you know, like there's a path. <laughs> you, you put in the time, yeah, you yeah. crank out the words, you get better every year, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a natural, it's a, it's a progression and a reliable progression. Mm. Right. And that has never been my experience of writing, yeah. you know, as a, as a sort of, 
you know, yes, hopefully I get a little better every year, but it's, it's so full of fits and starts and yeah. wrong turns and I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I feel like I get, I, I feel like I learn a lot. I feel like, I feel like learning and growth are reliable, but that, that translating into execution is not reliable for me. And I, I mean, I, 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 you know, and sometimes we, you and I, I think we've had this conversation over many years where somehow, where I think you are sometimes frustrated with a lack of grand ambition in the field or like in things that you see where you're yeah. like, and, and, um, which, you know, sometimes I share, like sometimes I read the, you know, I mean, it's sure if I go and read like the average magazine, you know, like read the magazines for a month, often I'm like, oh, you could have done so much more with this like why yeah. are you playing it safe in this story like sure i have that reaction but that doesn't stri that strikes me as like a sturgeon's law kind of like yeah well okay most lots of people are playing it safe yeah. but i don't have this but honestly when i look at something like that attitude about the you know the 20 bucks of 50k and it's like well just write faster I, i'm envious and i want to learn yeah. how to do that like i want to be more yeah. you know and in some ways i feel like i feel like uh if i had I have a whole alternate history in my head where if I quit my day job early and like had to make a living writing and had to force myself to just turn stuff mm -hmm. out and, and send it out before I liked it all that much. Yeah. Like maybe I'd be a better and happier writer just having developed that skill set or grit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and there's a way in which I feel like I'm a bit of a, you know, a self-indulgent dilettante. It's I, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to redesign my website which is old and creaky and now is act literally warning you in chrome that like you it's it does because it's a tls 1.1 and it's upgraded <laughs> yeah. it's a nightmare and i want to just have a new redesign and when i was looking at it and talking to somebody about about redesigning it and i was like you know at the moment i have the website of like a celebrated hobbyist Hmm. It is not like here's my next book, here's where to order. Right. It's very much it like here are the twenty languages I've been published in, in and like all of these. It's quirky and whimsical and fun and but it's not like, you know, I would actually like to like be a professional writer. <laughs> but it doesn't look like that. That's not where I that's not what I'm sending out into the world in a way. You know, I'm sending out yeah. like I am an entertaining and 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 you know, brilliant but but you know, ultimately peripheral marginal <laughs> uh celebrated hobbyist right and so there's a way in which it's like i've been I think, very resistant to redesigning my website <laughs> i think so that it's it, kind of funny i think that it requires something me now that yeah. my first novel is coming out in english like my debut novel i think that yeah. i have to make the psych a psychological transition to being willing psychologically to like yeah. have us you know commercial i mean I'm not saying it's going to be Fifty Shades of Grey because it's a strange book. I think it. I think. Yeah. It, I think it deserves a passionate, uh, a passionate following. But I'm yeah. not. You know, I. I didn't. I didn't set out to write. You know, I mean, as much as I love Hunger Games, and in, as much as in one of the of, of my in, in several of the years of edits, my mantra was more Hunger Games. But like, definitely, I was starting from stars in my pocket, like grains of sand, and heading in the direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's. It's. It's more likely yeah, yeah. to be. My model is closer to Dahlgren than 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 mm -hmm. Hunger Games. But, you know, nonetheless, like I, just being willing for it to succeed on its own terms, like it, it takes a certain psychological jump of my being willing because it's protective. It's protective of my ego yeah. to be a celebrated hobbyist. It's like right. people can admire me, but I'm not actually committing to like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's sort of safe to just be playing at it. And um, yeah, so, so, you, so you think you're going to make that shift? That's my intention yeah. <laughs> I, right. I am working on it and uh i'm looking forward to seeing the new website yeah where you will be talk talking not just about the unraveling but the next book yeah yeah well i mean and that's a, i mean the other yeah. thing is that trying to so i mean one of the things also is i i one of the reasons i took on writing this choice of games interactive fiction mm -hmm. thing is that i feel like um the fact that it has it, that it has this mixture of programming and writing um, helps reassure my brain, and I can just produce a lot of words. And also the fact that it's sort of, I think I've for for developing the game Dream Apart, I came up with all of this knowledge about like you know, uh, my you know this sort of magical Jewish historical fiction world, which I mean I gotta say Dream Apart, um, the the tabletop role playing game that I did, that is getting all this love at the moment. I know it's nice. It's, it's a great game. There's all the. I mean, partly I was smart enough to latch my uh, wagon onto Avery Alder, my favorite game designer, who is a 
joy to work with and she made an amazing and very economical and clever little game and so that is a big win but now all these people like we published this thing being like maybe we can sort of act like this is sort of a little bit of daring ambitious i mean talk about like you know are you are you are you trying to do something you know is your ambition like william gibson in the bar anecdote we were like yeah. maybe we can maybe more people will make games like this if we there's two now so we can write a chapter on like how to make your own game but i seriously was like that would be cute if someone did there's like yeah. one of my one of my role playing game podcasts I listen to is doing like a summer series on all of the belonging outside belonging games which have been based on our game that we made. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like anyway. Yeah. So and I feel part of the part of the love that I got for that was like that it that I think there's a hunger for Jewish fantasy, which is sort of unapologetically unassimilationist and like you know no like you know, there's certain there's a certain um I there was not a Jewish role playing game. Yeah, like bizarre, it's kind right? of the first, which is weird, given how many Jews, yeah. like a million Jews, spent their childhoods rolling polyhedral dice, pretending to be paladins who have crosses on their chest and carry around swords and kill lesser races. Come on! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know, that's a whole lot of polyhedral self hate. So yeah. so uh, so, uh, but there wasn't a anyway. So I don't know. So I. So I so partly I was like I should keep doing this. There's a there's a response. Yeah. Like there's a people are hungry for this. Um, yeah. That was one of the reasons that I that I went after it. But also because I was just like I you know I can I should I should be pushing in the direction of doing something that seems like fun and straightforward. But of course I still make it overly complicated. Like given that it's me, I like I can't help yeah. making it overly complicated. I, I was I, I I signed a contract to deliver hundred thousand words, ten chapters. Mm -hmm. I'm on like chapter four. It's already a hundred thousand words. Like I only yeah. owe them. I got an advance based on the fact that it'd be a hundred thousand words. It's already a hundred thousand words at chapter four because of all the branching. Because I want to have real conversations where people have different opinions and you can say all the things and it really feels anyway. So I'm yeah, which is I guess I mean on the one hand it's self sabotaging. On the other hand, it's a kind of a nice way to be self sabotaging. Yeah. <laughs> And I feel like in this particular context, it's like um, not even like it's definitely like my goal was to quickly turn out something. But of course, I made it more complicated and ambitious yeah. because I'm me. But I'm not, you know, I'm not I, I I'm OK with that in some way. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm trying to strike a balance. Like I know that I'm going to make yeah. it complicated and ambitious. Well, I'm trying to let myself. That, that balancing act is really kind of fascinating. Right. And I think it shifts over the course of your career, you know, we're both 30 years in something like that, yeah, you know, yeah. with stops, with stops and starts. Right. But I, I often have students who are in their twenties, right. Um, who are just starting and my 30 and it's, years it's, start at 10 years old, pause at 20 and resume at 30, but yeah, yes, go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's, you know, like there's a whole, um, there's a huge variation in how they approach ambition, I guess, right? And I think some of them are very self-protective and like, oh no, I'm just playing at this writing thing and I'm just doing it for fun. And, you know, um, but I can sort of see that there's a, a gleam of like, mm -hmm. that they don't want to, they don't want to necessarily admit. Of, admit to, of, yeah. You know, but then I also have the students who are, you know, like my advisor talking about me, you know, mostly naked ambition and yeah. not much else yeah. at that point, right? Yeah. Like they, they've read a lot. Yeah. They, so there, there's material in their head that's churning, yeah. but they've done very little writing so far, mm -hmm. right? Comparatively speaking, right? And so they don't have a lot of skills yet um, for translating it onto the page. Um, and, and they're dreaming really big and it's, yeah. it's, like there's a real temptation, I think. It's something that as a teacher, you got to watch out for, right? Because like there's a temptation to like be realistic with them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like you're dreaming too big yeah. and you have to just kind of like stifle that voice yeah. and be like, because you don't know. You don't know out of this class of 30, you don't know which ones are going to stay with it, which ones are going to put in the work, which ones are going to have a sudden breakthrough and you know that nobody could have predicted. You know um, nothing really. Yeah. Yeah. Artists, as much as I revere yeah. Delane, 
And as much as mm -hmm. I wanted to go to Clarion the year he was teaching, that was what made me start uh, mm -hmm. my plan of like my spreadsheet of like my game of, of going to Clarion, which uh, I, I, I am, you know, which I was very happy with the result of, which is I did not get to go to Clarion that year. I got to go to Clarion the next year when Octavia Butler was teaching. <laughs> so yeah. I'm very happy with that result. She was amazing. But the thing that I, I've, and I wasn't there, and so I don't know firsthand, but, but like apparently he does this thing where he tells well, so everyone I, if I, they're I, going I, to make so it. I, I was there, right? So I'll tell you what happened and maybe we'll, we should close this off. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I'll close with this because I think it's interesting. So um, preface this by saying I adore Chip Delaney. I wrote my bachelor's thesis on him for anyone coming in with this episode. One of my favorite writers absolutely shaped me. Yeah, me too. And I went to Clarion, I went to Clarion that year because, because he would be teaching there. Um, he, at the end of that week, his week of teaching, he came in and it was, I think the second week out of six. And he said, Harlan Ellison do, did this thing when he taught at Clarion. So yeah. he prefaced it. Yeah. And Harlan Ellison apparently went around the room <laughs> of the 17 people <laughs> pointing, you know, one to the next. And Harlan said, you're going to make it. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And, uh, went around the room and gave his frank evaluation yeah. Yeah. of who was going to be a success or not. And Delaney, so Delaney modified that. Delaney was uh -huh. like, I don't know. There's a lot of variables. And he also said, look, I've only read two of your stories. Yeah. Yeah, That's sure. all you've written so far. So I don't have a big sample size, but I teach in an MFA program. And I feel like often students go through two years of a program without ever getting an honest evaluation of their potential as a writer. Right. And that feel to him, he was like, this feels like it's doing them a disservice, right? Like they, if you were, I mean, he didn't say this, but like, presumably if you were going to med school, you'd be getting grades that would accurately reflect your knowledge of medicine. Right. Sure. Hopefully. Right. And in a master's program, everyone gets A's if you do the work, there's no <laughs> rating, right? Like there's no, so there's, sure. all you get are the critiques. And yeah. so there is no, so I, I understand where he was coming from. Yeah, although I think that, the analogy falls down a little because like nobody in a medical school program goes around the room being like, you will be a doctor, you will not. Getting a C is more like, you better hit the books. Not like, yeah. I have assessed your ultimate potential of doctorality. <laughs> Right. Like I can, right. I can smell a real doctor from those imposters. Like that, nobody in medicine would say that. You just have to learn the stuff. Yeah, yeah. You just have to learn the stuff. Well, so, but writing is a little more variable, right? So that it's harder to predict. And anyway, he went around, and he, what he said was one of three things: either I see something very interesting in your work, you're on the right path, great. Um, I don't see anything interesting in what you're doing. It's you know, like I'm not, I'm not seeing a path for you to becoming a writer, uh, a published writer. And then the third was there's something interesting here, but it's blocked. It's not fully formed. It's, you know, I don't know if you're going to work through it or not. And uh, then he went around the room and uh, there was a huge debate afterwards about whether it would be better to do this publicly or in private huh. session. Um, because why is you know, that a debate? <laughs> what possible? Uh, what could possibly be achieved by doing it publicly? Honestly, well, I, I actually end up thinking it's better doing it publicly because what happened, and I don't know that I would have predicted this, right? But if it had happened, we all had mm. private conferences with him, right? So if he'd said this in the private conference, ah. it, it would have had so much weight. Well, I suppose right? that's true. Yeah, you, you would have gotten the the sage on the mountain right, telling you, right. You don't, yeah. you ain't got what it takes, kid, uh, right? Yeah. And then you go off and be crushed. Yeah. And what happened when he did it publicly is we all went out for pancakes afterwards like, that was and bitch, bitched about it. <laughs> yeah. and, and we got to process and we got to reassure each other and talk it yeah, through. Sure. And it was, uh, well, I guess, so I, actually, I guess I see your point. That could be. Better. So it was, it felt shaming in the moment, but yeah. overall, I think it did less harm that well, way. Well, that probably was um, your group was strong enough by that point that they didn't, because it would be worse if they all took it as the sage on the mountain. If everyone yeah, had sort yeah. of delegated their trust in him and being like, "Oh, I thought you were good, but I guess not," yeah, then that would no, make it, it was, all much. That would that would be an amplifying effect. Yeah. But what you're saying is right. a counterbalancing effect. Yeah, I mean, there's 17 people, so like with that many, I think it's like 
reasonably likely that some people are going to be pissed off by this. And it, that actually led to a minor scandal because ours was the first Clarion that had people blogging while they were oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. And I remember. So I, w- I was blogging and then one of our other people was blogging and she was so angry that she wrote about Chip that fucker Delaney um, <laughs> in her blog post, yeah. which then got picked up uh. by people who were very upset that uh-huh. a student was being so disrespectful to <laughs> Uh, a teacher in a the giant field, of the and field. It, yeah, sure. A giant in the field, and it's gonna like she's gonna. We should blacklist her, and so on. So there was a, wow. a whole like early internet um, thing, which I think is sort of a, a fascinating sidebar. But anyway, I, I see what he was going for. It was very upsetting at the time, and I just don't. I'm it's sorry, not I don't even, even. I mean, I'm sure it's like for one and, thing, and it I think, seems and, I, and not useful, right? Like I think that's he was actually my main what he's, point. My main point and, is and, and, I don't see how that's useful. Yeah, and what he said about my work, I think, in retrospect, is accurate. I was in that third group of, like, there's some interesting stuff here, but it's not fully formed. I think that was probably a, a good assessment of my work at that point, but it wasn't helpful to me to hear I don't it. See how, it. I don't see how any yeah. of those three categories are helpful. The first category yeah. is, like, what does that, I mean, I suppose it's yeah. encouragement, and encouragement can be precious, but, like... Yeah. I don't understand why there's a scarcity of encouragement and you couldn't encourage everyone. Like, I think yeah. there's, I think this comes from this old, like, uh, there's this sort of perverse machismo of the sort of golden age science fiction writer generation. I don't revise. I type on a different typewriter with each hand. I pump out the words. I send them out. I get three cents a word. And if you can do anything else but writing, you should, because it's a hard road. If you're not really, if you're not man enough for this hard road. I mean, it's right. like, really? Well, and there's, well, but okay, but I'll, I will, I'll caveat this by saying I think part of what he and I think he talked about this. I'm not saying if that was coming, Delaney's motivation. I'm just saying no, no, I feel no, like historically. Like, I think if you're coming at it from the MFA program thing, there is a real concern, especially now. I mean, it's much worse now than it was back in 1997 when I was a Clarion. MFA programs have gotten incredibly expensive, right? right? Well, and that's, so, yeah, that's... Um, and so there is a real like. You know, if people are going to come and mortgage two years of their life and a lot of their financial future for this program and not even get and and no one tells them at any point during the program whether they have a shot at making a career out of it. I think that's what he was feeling like there were all these people who'd gotten only encouragement to be writers and as a result had not like had had made very risky financial decisions for their future. And I think it really worried him. And so, um, I mean, that does sound like a real problem, but I just can't imagine like, yeah, no, I don't think people are an MFA program. Like, sure. If you literally can't put a sentence together, like there should be some kind of, but didn't they have to get accepted to the MFA program? Isn't there, you know what I mean? Like, isn't there some (laughs) level of like, like sure. well, I, well, I think that I think that's where the problem is. Is that like it's not that they couldn't write; they can all write. You know, right. they can all write well. And but what the he thing wanted he's to be, talking about he was, is so what he wanted to talk about is like, can you? Yeah, I know. He's he wanted to talk about like, do I think you can make a career at this? But really? that is totally different and, than do I think you're going after something? Like literally, literally, my my level of confidence that Chip Delaney would have told who wrote who wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. Whatever, whatever that person is, the Fifty Shades of Grey yeah. author. Like my level of conference that Delaney would have been, well, it's not to my taste, but I think you're going to be a bestseller. Really? Like I am, a, <laughs> I, I would like bet, I will like bet, I, I will take a three to one odds bet that Delaney would have said, you're not going to make it. Like, uh, just like, what? How? Based on? Like, yeah. Because no, well, am I interested, thing. is Chip Delaney interested in your work is if anything probably negatively correlated with how much money you're going to make? I don't know. Anyway. Maybe that's unfair. But like, I mean, and I'm putting myself in that same category. Like I also yeah, yeah, have yeah. like, you know, not, the, not, not, not necessarily mass popular tastes, yeah. but like, I don't know. Like it just, and it also just seems like what's predictive of it is like, what's predictive of whether you're going to make a living at it is, yeah. are you going to be doggedly persistent enough to like somehow find a niche of people who are going to connect with the particular thing you're doing. Yeah. And there's no, there's no particular standards for that. You know what I mean? There's not like, I I do. I think that three decades ago, there may have been more of a belief that there were particular standards. Like the, the field is diversified so much. Well, there were more gatekeepers. So, I mean, I'm more more confident three decades ago 
I mean, it, this wasn't three decades ago that you're talking, though. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it was but maybe I'm, I'm 20 years of, ago. But I'm, thinking, but I'm thinking of, like, when Delaney came when Delaney up. Delaney came up, his... sure. I, I can imagine yeah. that when Harlan Ellison is teaching a Clara in, in, in Days of Yore, yeah. uh, teaching Octavia Butler, he can give a reasonable assessment of how likely is your current prose to get through the gatekeepers, because the gatekeepers have some kind of consensus platform. Right. In is Campbell going to buy this story? Right. Yeah. In 2020, yeah, that yeah, is yeah. nonsense because literally your 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 command of grammar could be terrible. But if you can deliver amazing, you know, like whatever the there's some group of readers who are going to kindle and Goodreads the hell out of what you're delivering, <laughs> if you are going to scratch their itch, and that is li like, can you? There there are no Which is fabulous. Right. Yes, no, that no. is fabulous. Right, right. And and yeah. And, and the literary mores of different subgroups are totally distinct from one another. They don't value the same things. It's not, I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I will, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. Here's my last thought here, which is that our video editor is, uh, Darius, is one of my former students. And so he's listening to all of this. And I think he would vouch for feeling the same thing that a, a lot of my students kind of ask for is they they are young writers and they are they would like someone to tell them whether they've got it or not right like <laughs> right you know and i think sure that's they a would really like someone like sure <laughs> of course they would like someone to like can i pull the sword out of the stone am i the chosen yeah. one of course they would like you to be gandalf <laughs> and tell them that or i guess merlin in this yeah. analogy but you yeah. can't because you don't yeah. know. Like it's I don't know. Is the temptation here is for the teacher to pretend that they can tell who's yeah. Arthur. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't buy it. I'm not buying it. Yeah. I mean, no, I'm with you. Yeah. I think I think uh, it's I think we should know. publish this so that we can get a lot of hate mail on this particular conversation because <laughs> there's gonna be a million people who want hopefully there will be a lot of people who want to come on the show to tell me I'm wrong. That's like I, yeah. that, I, 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 I feel like that would be great. Like I feel I feel like some of our author friends would totally come down the well, other side. Well and I think this, this but... is so maybe we can pick this up a little bit with um, we're hoping to have a guest next time we come back, um, Judd Hartman, who was my senior fiction editor at Strange Horizons for a long time. And uh, one of the things that Judd and I sometimes bump heads on is whether there's such a thing as bad fiction or good fiction, and what do we mean by that? And he, I think, would argue that there's no such thing. And I'm like, how can you argue that when you're an editor deciding what stories to buy? And then we go off into a whole long thing. Coherent, but sure, OK. Fair yeah, enough. well, it's we we should explore it in more detail because I think this this all of this is kind of leading to this question of like how do we evaluate the work either for ourselves, right? Which is where where maybe we started this conversation with like when we have big failures where maybe the market tells us we've messed up or maybe we've just messed up, right? Whatever it is, and um, how do we come back from that? And I, I think at some point you do have to learn how to judge for yourself whether it's good, right? And I think, like, something that you're going to be happy of to course. publish. And of course, so... of course. But that doesn't require that there be an objective standard out in the universe or that what you believe... Yes, like, like most of the stories that I write that I don't sell are because I don't like them enough, not because other people reject them. I feel like I've read a lot of really bad stories. So we'll come back to it. Okay. So thanks. No, no, no. <laughs> I read a lot of like erotica slush. And, oh, I'm not saying uh, there's not stories that are, but I will. I mean, the, the, I think that will be a fun tangent to go on the objectively bad. And that's sort of like a, I don't know, postmodernist versus like, what, what is your view of, of like yeah. coherence of knowledge or whatever. But, but, but there's another very practical operational question, which is you as a writer need to learn whether you, what you can stand behind and believe in and whether you like, whether, whether this yeah. story is doing what you want it to do. There's another whole axis, right. which is fiction that is accomplished, but destructive. Like that's another mm -hmm. like the, the, the moral a weight of, kind of another, a different kind of bad, which is I mean, which is a different kind of bad. But is it? That's another question. Yeah. Um, well, and so, there's also the also the like, this is not my best work, but it makes me money. I mean, there is hack writing, right? Like I spent a year writing porn for Puritan and it was definitely not my best work. I didn't. There was always something I liked about the stories, or I probably couldn't have gotten through writing them. Yeah. But I, I certainly wasn't bringing all my powers to bear either, right? And so that's a 
anyway, all right. Well, we'll we'll leave, we'll come back to this. I think so. Uh, thanks, guys, and uh, more soon. We need a catchphrase. We do. We need an outgoing catchphrase. Stay human. We need a stay human. Or not. <laughs> or not. Or... Very good. All right. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.